What does a tour manager do? What does he do? Pretty much everything. I was wrong about God. Turns out he likes that 70s stuff after all. So it didn't piss down and they played four on Let me tell you what it's like to manage a rock band. We're driving all over, hell and creation. City to city, roadies and crew the whole nine. And not one person, not one, ever asks how we're always stocked up on gas. I do not for one think that the problem was that the band was down. I think that the problem may have been that there was a Stonehenge monument on the stage that was in danger of being crushed by a dwarf. Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and good golly, Miss Molly. Welcome once again to It's Only Talk and Roll, the show where we banish negative vibes and we talk about the things that we love, the things that we're trying to keep alive, the flame of classic rock, classic movies, classic anything. Hell, I'm a classic at my age. Vintage, no less. Uh, but yeah, uh, <laughs> hello to everyone out there on YouTube. And on, and on Rumble, uh, please, if you can help us out today by leaving a like and uh, get into the chat and make your comments and ask your questions, share the stream out, all that great stuff. It is all greatly appreciated. And a big thanks to you all for, for being here. We'll have a, a little uh, check in on, on who's joined us in the chat uh, in a few minutes. But right now, I'd like to introduce our super special guest for today, the very wonderful Mr. Mal Craggs. How are you, sir? Hey. Hi, oh, guys. Hey. <laughs> a, oh, bit of a, a bit of a techno itch at the beginning there. Yeah, awesome to see you, my friend. I guess you're dealing with the UK's 64K modem dial-up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe not that bad. That's, that, that just went like that, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome to see you again, sir. And I, I do love the, uh, the the um the, the stuff on the walls behind you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You got your gold records, what your silver, we, platinum. What have we got? What have we got there? We got Phil Collins platinum. Uh, that's for no jacket required. Wow. B. Genesis Abacab platinum. Awesome. Pink Floyd. Uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder, Platinum. 
Wow. And this one over here, I don't know if you can see that. I'll just do yeah. that. We see it. That's that's my wife's, and that's from Status Quo. Oh, the magnificent Quo, the beloved Quo. Yeah. She said you know? she'd rather have had a bonus, you know. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> she better get the, the disc. A woman for you. <laughs> Well, welcome, Mal. I know it's late in the UK. Thanks very much for joining us. No, no problem. Uh, Liverpool have been playing today. You know, they're my oh, team. So they've uh, just beaten Leeds 6 1. Oh, so, awesome. Yes. That's a, that's a big lead. Oh. Yeah, that is massive. <laughs> yes, in a soccer game, 6 to 1. Good Lord. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I'd just like to say, before we get going, hello to everyone on my wonderful, wonderful panel. We've got a full uh, Hollywood Squares going now, all nine of us. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, John, Gary, Imp, Pope, Dustin, Joe, and Courtney. How are you all? Doing good, doing good, man. Looking yeah, forward no to this. Always love the stories about the music. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed, and uh, well, Gary, uh, hi everyone. Jump on the internet. Hey, Corey, hi, Corey. You guys. <laughs> yeah. So you can hear me now. We can okay. hear yes. you, Courtney. Yes, thanks for being here. Thank Great. you all of you for being here. We'll have a chance to chat to you all individually later. And I know a lot of you, you've, you've all got questions for Mal, and and we will get to those for sure. Um, but over the past few, welcome, Mal. We got you. We got you, Courtney. We can hear you. So. Before we get going, though, a quick uh, hello to everybody in the chat. Thank you for being here. We've got Random Brad Creator. Um, someone called Courtney is in the chat. Uh, D-Bud Martin, who's modding for us. Thank you very much, D-Bud. Uh, we always uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, we have Rebel Dragon. Good to see you. We have uh, the wonderful Anima Confusa, a woman with impeccable taste except in one area. Oh, it's my, <laughs> it's my girlfriend, so he's shitting on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kitty Bear is here. Good to see you. And, um, yeah, uh, everybody in the chat, please, as I say, leave a like, share the stream out. We want to get as many people to watch today as possible. And if you're watching over in Rumble, leave a few chats. We're going to see if we can get on the featured front page of Rumble today, So, which we've done in the past. So... Over the last few weeks, um, both here and on Morning Coffee with Brian, which is on Gary's channel, Pop Culture Minefield, we've been doing some fascinating shows with the Rock and Roll Rowdies. Uh, wow. And we've had uh, Wilco on. We had Mal on on the Thursday morning show before. It's good to see you back, Mal. Uh, we've had um, Granny. Uh, Mal, you seem to be the only one without a nickname, though. Hey. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just was always known as Mel or oh, Cragsy. That Craig. was it. Yeah. Craggy Isle. <laughs> Somebody so, had to be normal. One of us so, had to be normal. <laughs> that's right. Well, compared to Wilco and Granny, yeah, but that's uh, that's for for sure. Yeah, um, you know, I, Granny was just totally crazy. He comes across now like this dead, straight on, train spotting kind of guy who's got yeah. a great memory. <laughs> I don't oh, have a great memory. But he's got a honestly, treasure trove of materials as well. Now. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, for those who have not seen any of the shows so far, uh, the Rock and Roll Rowdies, and this is the YouTube uh, channel here, are a bunch of veteran road and tour managers from Hart, all from Hartlepool in the northeast of England, uh, who, who got into the business in the late 60s and have seen it all. I think it's fair to say, Mal. Been there, seen it, done it, got the t shirt, as they say. <laughs> and it Most used to fit me, the t shirt used to fit me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've probably got a warehouse full of t shirts. Oh, Don, I've just, I'm having a clear out at the moment now, and I've just come across some T-shirts that were from a Page and Plant tour. And I said to my wife, look at the size of this. This is American XL. I said, it's never been worn. I said, it's far too big for me. She said, it'll fit you now. I said, no way. <laughs> I tried it on. Cutting. It's, 
Yeah. 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 <laughs> Could be, yeah. I was about was... 100 and, I was 140 pounds when I was touring. I'm now about 190. Yeah, and we've got some pictures of you in your prime that we'll be showing uh, in a few minutes. Uh, those who did w watch your appearance... Well, I don't know about prime. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think the, 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 the girls would, would be impressed, and they're probably going to be impressed when they see this picture. But, um, <laughs> let's just say the package is being delivered. But um, uh, the <laughs> Hey, it was the era of short shorts, oh, no. not just for Bullshit. women. Yeah. Oh Lord! Hey, that was He's got a basketball style, picture, you know? does he? Oh, oh boy! No wonder that was Gary's favorite decade. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, for those who didn't see, so, yeah. So, rock and roll rowdies, please check them out on on YouTube, and they're also you guys are also got a group on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm not a member of either of those, so I find it hard to put those on the screen. But yeah, check the rowdies out, and uh, they've got a bunch of videos up there. And yes. also ch check back on the shows that we've been doing, both on this channel and on Pop Culture Minefield, with uh, Mal and Wilco and Granny. We've we've just had the most incredible shows, I think, with with wonderful memories, and and uh, and there's lots more to be extracted. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, so let's let's uh, we will for those who did see you on the Thursday show that morning show we did Mal we're, we're probably going to recap some stuff if that's okay just because there'll be a different uh, slightly different audience here so um, but you know you've just uh, had this incredible okay. uh, incredible incredible career but it all started back in um, good old Hartlepool um, <laughs> <laughs> And here we, we see the dangers of rock and the roll. The one on my left, I was going to a wedding that day. Yeah. Was, was yeah. Granny at that wedding too? Was I was that? a bit of was in the small faces at the time. It does. You look like the you're in the moody the, blues or the left, small faces. Yeah, I, yeah. I love that picture on the right. Yeah, well, I was a, I, I was, yeah, small, definite small faces fan. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you look a bit like Danny Lane in the Moody Seven, Blues as well. 18 back then. Yeah. And oh. uh, this is what, a six-month gap or a year's gap between these two pictures? Yeah, this is what. <laughs> Kids, don't take drugs. <laughs> or do take drugs. Just make sure you've got no. leather. <laughs> Too late. Just kidding. <laughs> Too late, yeah. So this is the dangers of rock and roll. Um and this is the 60s, of course. So, you know, it was that time of an explosion. In uh, uh, He looks like half of my friends back in high school. <laughs> <laughs> we all looked like they, we were, we that, nicknamed that each other the basement rats because we hung out in basements. Yeah. Now, moving ahead a bit, and we will cover, we're, we're going to cover the intervening years. Here's another one of you. That would work. have been about 1968, 69. The, the other one, yeah. 68, 69, yeah. Yeah. Still in Hartlepool, just about to go to London, I guess. Yeah, yeah, just making the transition. And um, and this is you slightly later. This is at backstage at Womad in 1980 with your good lady wife who was working for Status Quo and you were, I think, working for Peter Gabriel by uh, this time. Uh, yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. We met. We met in Australia. I was touring with uh, I was touring with Status Quo at the time, uh, and that's how we met. Uh, and then when I came back, I left Quo. That rocking all over the world tour, and I started working for Peter, which was the first of the Genesis family that I worked for, and in Bath at the first WOMAD festival that Peter organized. WOMAD, yeah. Paid for everything. I bankrupted him. Peter, that, year. That, that festival, the WOMAD festival. Yeah. It almost We're bankrupted him. Great world music on there. Yeah, we're losing you a little bit. You know, Dennis has finished up doing a, a, a show at Milton Keynes, a town in in middle England or Milton Keynes uh, yeah. and the all, all the Genesis guys got 
together and kind of done this concert and bailed Peter out. You know, Indeed, was, yeah, they, he put a lot of money out in Rome. It was strange. Uh, it was Ali on stage in a cro coffin, and then it was his resurrection. I was going to ask: Was Pete as strange as his costumes and and videos? I mean, were you there when he had the inverted? Peter, I've got I hope he was that weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Peter used to change. It, it just depended on what was happening in Peter's life. You know, if he, if there was a trauma, it really affected him. You know, uh, st stuff really affected Peter. Mm. He was a little introvert until he hit that stage, and then he become the total extrovert that you see on stage. You know, uh, yeah, yeah well, he was. Well, there. Uh, he, we were in we were in Cleveland one time, and he kicked the dressing room door, mm. and then he went round backstage and apologized to every person for his outbreak. You know, well, and, he was a well raised control. middle class middle class grammar school boy, so I guess he had that manners in him. Well, I think yeah, well upper middle class. You know, his mm. his wife Jill, I think. Her, her, her father was like the Queen's tour manager. Not Queen, the group, <laughs> the Queen. Her Majesty. <laughs> did, so, I so think did he she... was called Sir Richard something or other. <laughs> yeah, did he have a? Did and the Queen have a backline? Did the Queen have a backline? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that there's an organised. I, I met Prince Charles. I was presented to Prince Charles and, mm. and when uh, we'd done some shows at Wembley with Genesis and he said to me, mm. and what do you do? You know, I said, oh. and he went, oh, you're Mel, you're their babysitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, yeah, kind of. He said, I've got one of those <laughs> and looked over his shoulder, you know. So, so they, so we they have the same kind of uh, entourage going on around them as what the, you know, the top rock stars do. Yeah, the same amount of sex and drugs as well, I would imagine. Well, well, he was one of the first guys see. with the Prince's Trust, right? Peter Absolutely, Gabriel? yeah. Phil yeah. was... Uh, Gabriel, Phil yeah. Too, yeah. You know, along with Phil. Phil was on the, on the, on the board with, along with Pete Townsend and Eric Clapton. Hmm. You know, they were all members of the Prince Charles's Trust. And Monty Python, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It so is a strange mix, that. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're going to talk about and play clips of all those artists and some of those gigs that you, you were tour manager for later. I just wanted to go back to this wonderful picture, which um, obviously the groupies were having a, a field day in this day. Looking up my shorts, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, the it dangers of rock and roll. Place to advertise, you know that. That's right. Uh, are those to... considered Daisy Dukes? <laughs> <laughs> Not at the time they Way weren't. Before time. Way before our time. Yeah, so I guess the, the, the girls weren't just looking at the band, though. They were looking at you guys, too. <laughs> you know, there's benefits. There's benefits, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Fringe benefits. Have you still got those shorts? Yep. They still fit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet they do, yeah. Um, so uh, with your indulgence, Mal, I'd like to just move back to, to uh, your early days. As we've said in the previous shows, you're from Hartlepool, way up north, the north of England. Yeah. Nice little town. Well, the rough part of town is where Wilco's from. You're from the a nice part of town. <laughs> I would never call it a nice part. Of town. Yeah, but you grew up there in the sixties, and uh, I guess what were your earliest memories of music then, and getting into music as a kid? Well, you know, we were, we were definitely getting into that music. You know, we were, you know, the the seventeen, eighteen, you know getting into new music there was a lot of new music going on going on at the time yeah you know 
Top of the pops. A, a spin off of all the all the big groups that were out there, you know, like the Beatles and the Stones. There was a lot of new music going on. Mm. Going to see the Heartwoods, a band called the Heartwoods, which was oh, Ronnie Wood's brother. Ronnie Wood, yeah. 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 You know, so, so did you see them in Hollywood? Uh well, they're there or thereabouts, you know. Well, there were shows like Top of the Bob, Steady, Steady Go. The area, there was a lot of Family is another one we used to go and see regular, a band called Family. I don't know if you know them over there. Uh, yeah, Roger, Cha uh, but, Roger uh, Chapman. Roger, Roger Chapman. Chapman yeah. yeah. John Wetton. Oh, John Wetton. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic so these, band. Yeah. So these, you started going to gigs. Um, in in the northeast before you you um, got into to working in the business, um, did you start working? Did you go down to London first and then start working as a roadie, or, or who did that? No, happen? no. Uh, in in Hartlepool because we were you know getting on that we used to see the guys around, and one of my uh, older brother's uh, friends, he was a bass player in a band. Um, and so I knew this guy called Les Taylor, uh, and he said to me, why, why don't you come along? You you know, you're into it. Come along, you can give us a hand, you know. And so I went along and just got to know the guys. They were in a band called Katie's Engine, you mm -hmm. know, local brute. And we were playing the bars and the, the, the work men's clubs in the area, you know, the night spots. We were doing it all. And Great were, guitar player, guitar player called Alan Place, who was fantastic. You mm. know, I've, I still rate Alan, and I work with a lot of great guitar players. I believe you, know, you like have. Gilmore, Townsend, Gary Moore. You know, yeah, Mick Box. You know, well, we're uh, going to talk about your idea. Alan, yeah, yeah, Mickey, fantastic. And and so we, we, we were gigging around the area uh, and then and they were getting more equipment. Things were growing, you know, bands grow, the, the gigs grow. Uh, and so I got my friend Alan, Granny, and said, come and give us an end. You know, you, he said, I don't know. I said, look, you can pick up a drum case. You can pick up an amplifier. It's all you need to do. We went yeah. the first time we came along. The first night he came along, we played at this local bar club, uh, and there was free booze in the dressing room. <laughs> so he was, in, you know, there he was, and then he decides, oh, all the girls, <laughs> the girls were looking good. So then he's tried to pull all the local girls. Mm. Then we had to get him out of the back because the local boys didn't like it, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but that so was that, grand. that was he was always into trouble like that, always. Yeah. You know, we so were outside are... the Rainbow in in L.A. one night. We were outside. He comes out, and he was being obnoxious as, as his way. And the bouncer said, leave, otherwise I'm going to. The, the doorman, leave or I'm going to knock you out, you know, and he go on then, knock me, and the guy hit him, he went over the bond of this car, mm. right, he got up, walked back round, he said to the guy, but you can't do that again, <laughs> wherever he goes, <laughs> He's got a shattered cheekbone. Oh, jeez, and the thing is, he seems just, lo but lovely, but that was hey? the first he did, he, he would. He had no fear of anything, you know. He walked into a, a biker's bar one time and tried to pull their chicks, you know. Oof, yeah, yeah, Jeez. that's Just dangerous, crazy, right there. Crazy yeah. Guy. Well, English roadies as well yeah, in the US. You know, yeah, no concept of his. Uh, uh, no concept. No, oh, I'm just. You know, I'm just. Hanging out, I'm just being nice to the girls, having fun. Uh -uh. <laughs> yeah, well, I think yeah. Wilco hinted at some really bad stuff that happened on the strip a couple of times when you guys were there uh, on Sunset Strip. Yeah, uh, it was a slightly dangerous place. Um, <laughs> occasionally, granny's around, <laughs> he seems like such care. a quiet, you can't even fight. 
Yeah. Can't even fight. He couldn't defend himself if he wanted to. Yeah. He's such a quiet guy as well. Such a quiet guy. Lovely guy. <laughs> and he's supposed to be the intelligent one of us. Yeah. But, you, but you, you three were pretty tight. So Wilco and, and Granny and you, you're all from Hartlepool. I think, did you go down to London first? Or was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of myself and granny kind of went there uh i always tell the story of like going to see the stones play in hyde park in 1969 and i never went home again and i didn't yeah. really you know I, I i kind of drifted up and down but uh, i never moved back there you know once i'd seen the stones and had some of that you know hyde park uh so this was 1969. This, yeah. the, Brian Jones had just died. Uh, Mick Taylor was playing his first gig yeah. with the band. And a free gig in Hyde Park, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah. You're, there, you're in that the, crowd the somewhere. There was about 250,000 people there, you know. Yeah. So I got a little clip uh, of it. I'm just going to show if, if you guys are up for okay. that. Okay. Yeah. So this you're out there in this crowd somewhere. I guess this is a big thrill coming from Hartlepool to come down to this. You know? I love the Hells Angels. Yeah, I mean this was like whoa. This is this, this is where I want to be. This is where I want to be. You know? Yeah, I want to be doing this. You know? Yeah, I uh, think. Do you recall much about and, that? And we were day? just hanging out at the marquee. And dim walls, you know, the clubs, the, the, the marquee, you know, the Stones played at the marquee, Hendrick played at the marquee, Crane played at the marquee, the Who played the marquee. You just hung out at the marquee. It was a bar. It only held 600 people, but it was just fantastic place yeah, to be. Yeah, I've been to one uh, gig there, which was the band UFO, which was a, a brilliant gig, warm-up gig for a tour. Um, okay. Yeah. The, there was a speakeasy as well where you guys basically picked the up a little work. Speakeasy, yeah, that was, yeah, that was for after afterwards. You'd go to the speakeasy, yeah. And you used to, it was downstairs. It was a basement bar, bar club. You'd go down the stairs, and as you walked in there, there would be Lemmy. There was a, a fruit machine, a one arm bended Lemmy with his JD and Coke. And a cigarette because you were allowed to smoke in bars then. Cigarette mm. on the go, JD and Coke, playing the one arm bended. And he stayed there till four in the morning you know, <laughs> when they closed up. Love he the picture of that bar. Just, That's cool. He loved that yeah, one arm bended. Ended. Yeah. I remember got, being there, there doing too, a though. gig there one time. Yeah. Doing a gig there one time and with the band called Armada. Hmm. Uh, and uh, this guy said to me, oh, do you think the band will let me jam with them, you know, come up and do something? And I said, well, I don't know, I'll ask them. But they were a very, uh, like, uh, they had things of being King Crimson, the next King Crimson. Hmm. They were in that ilk. Uh, and... So they just went, no, we're not interested. The guy wouldn't know what timing and about how, because they used to play these weird timing sequences. I said, no, no, we we don't want him. So I had to go back to this guy and said, sorry, Elton, they won't let you play with them. <laughs> Elton John. <laughs> he couldn't Elton handle John. it. He couldn't handle it, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that scene must yeah, that scene must have been incredible. Late sixties, early seventies, marquee, speakeasy, yeah. bands, lots yeah. of bands played was, at the speakeasy. It was just cool, you know, it was a bit like the, the it was a bit like being in LA at the Rainbow, but cooler. If you know, and that might upset some people by saying the speakeasy was cooler than you know, the rainbow, but 
I spent a lot of time in both. And and people used to just hang out at the speakeasy. You know, mm -hmm. they would just you could if there was a seat next to Jimmy, you could go and sit down and chat to him, you know, or Rod Stewart or Mick Jagger or or Elton John, you know, you could just go and sit next to them and chat. Oh, Jimmy, there we are. Uh, yeah, and you, yeah. you um, um Noel Redding, there was a pub uh, called the Golden Lion on Fulham Broadway. And uh, all these guys used to hang out there as well, you know. Yeah, Mitch I mean, Mitchell you, you, lived across the street from it. Oh well. You you saw a lot of bands at this I mean a lot of bands played at the speakeasy. We've had deep, deep purple yeah. gigs there and all sorts, yeah. 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 It was it was one of those, you know, it was like a, a jamming place. Mm. You know, there, there was there would be a band playing, but generally, you know, they'd get up and say, Oh, do you mind if we play with you? You know, everybody kind of jammed there. It was one of those when I when I worked with Floyd, we'd get in town and we had a we'd have a night off. And one of the first or two of the things I had to do was find a good Italian restaurant, hmm. a good Italian restaurant that doesn't mean expensive, just good food, yeah, you know, and a bar with a a live band, hmm. and they would go there. So we'd go and eat. Then they go there, and and David always get up and jam, always you wow. know. And the drummer yeah. that we had, Gary, Gary Wright, was it? No, um, it Gary Wallace. Gary Wallace. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah the Gary keyboard Wallace, player, Gary Wright. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they would get up and jam, you know, and it was fantastic. Yeah, you know. but they'd never play a Pink Floyd song ever. They would never <laughs> no. ever play. Well, Dave Floyd's. Gilmore loves rock and roll and blues. So he's yeah, like well, that's what he used to do. They used to, you know, they, they, yeah, David say, go on, do you mind? You know, no. <laughs> no, you can't come up and play the tower well, with Well, that's his Gilmore. job, is playing Pink Floyd. <laughs> he's doing this stuff for fun. We've got a whole bunch of clips and, and images of, of, your, of the Pink Floyd tours that you were involved with, which includes the Venice uh, game. Yeah. Which is just yeah. phenomenal. If you that ever was that, that was fantastic. You know, three days yeah. on the barge. <laughs> you hey, we, can, <laughs> we could skip to that now if you want. I mean, it's, hey, <laughs> we don't it's we don't guys. we you, don't guys. have to stick to the plan. We could go. Hey, so if you've got a plan, you know, and you want to go with it, I'll go with it. I'm no, easy. Let's, so... I'm, I'm flexible. That's the old thing that I've always said about being a tour manager. You've got to be flexible. You know, you've got to be be able to take that phone call at three in the morning and say we we not staying here for the next four days we're going to positano instead in italy you know oh yeah but we're in germany right now i know tell get the pilot out of bed tell him we're going to positano tomorrow yeah yeah so we'll actually okay. jump to let's jump to the pink floyd here i mean we've, we've this is way further down in your career from those early days in London and we're going to go back and look at those bands but this is yeah. my favourite one of my favourite yeah, trios the, this is one of the pinnacles yeah. yeah so by this time this is 1988-ish and you're actually you're, you're tour 87, manager 87, 88 yeah, yeah. 80, I just finished 10 month world tour with Genesis uh, and I had and Dave uh, Tony Smith, who was Genesis manager, was talking to Steve O'Rourke, who was uh, Floyd's manager, and and they said, "Oh, Steve, this is the guy you need on your tour." And he said, "What does he do?" And he said, "And Tony said, I don't know, but he gets it done. <laughs> what he'll <laughs> so do is he'll get things done for you. He gets it done. He makes it happen." Uh, yeah. And so Steve said to me, "Right." Can you be in Toronto, on, you know, in two days' time? And I said, I've just done 10 months around the world. He said, okay, can you be there next Saturday? I went, okay, mm -hmm. then. So I had about six days off. And I went to Toronto, and we done our pr production rehearsals in an aircraft hangar at the airport, you know, the international airport, because it was the only thing that was big enough to house Y Y Z. YYZ Toronto yeah. Airport, yeah, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So, 
I spent more time in the Four Seasons Hotel in Toronto than I did in my house that year. <laughs> so can I, I can had I just... six weeks in, that, in that hotel, and I had about three weeks in my house in, in London. I guess you didn't really know your house that well. <laughs> You never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can I ask though, Mel? What you were tour manager on this tour? You were, you were. Yeah, I manager? went there. I, I was initially employed as a, an assistant tour manager, but the tour manager that they had, he got canned before mm. we'd done a show. For he was he was a bit of a naughty boy, uh, and. As Nick said, he was riding the gravy train. Why didn't he just slow it down a bit? You know, he was taking <laughs> advantage. He took yeah, right. a, uh, he took advantage. Uh, uh, well, if anybody in the chat I've got or that poster, panel, yeah, anyone in the chat or or in the panel has questions uh, for Mal, then fire away. You know, I mean, Pink Floyd, particularly about Pink Floyd, as we're on that right now. Al Ron. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am curious about something about, um, like, because all of these bands I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, but I think the biggest one, of course, was Peter Gabriel for me, because I've just been a fan since I was a kid. And uh, oh, and I'm a lot older yeah. than I look. I'm actually right up there with uh, my buddy, my Scottish buddy over here in, in age. And, <laughs> you know, I remember the 60s and, and my brother, Steve, who's a Vietnam vet, he introduced me to a lot of this Pink Floyd, Genesis, all of it. And uh, but in all the things that I've ever seen, the single artist that I've ever felt delivered a live show to the way they sounded on an album was Peter Gabriel. From the vocal arrangements to the uh, musical arrangements, everything. And, and I know that he's a tech guy. I know that he is. Yeah. Uh, what was yeah. that like? And how did you feel about that? Cause do you feel that he was as good live as he was on an album well i'm just it's strange that's a good question because i'm listening to his new stuff at the moment and i can't wait to see it live because right. i think he, he's better live he is he, is he really record. is uh he's one of the most evocative uh singer songwriters i've ever seen yeah he's it he just people say oh have you got a favorite gig and I go, any Peter Gabriel show, any show well, that I don't Peter. And to answer this, Peter then, it, I find he is beloved by more musicians, almost as much as he, by just regular fans. Mus he yeah. is a one of those singer, songwriter, musician, composers that's beloved by other artists yeah. for what he does. Well, he, he, he breaks the mold a bit. And they look at him and think, oh, I never thought of doing that that way. You know, and like you say, the tech stuff, you know, he's got a brain that's out there, you know. He'd go out and and he'd be striking a recording, hitting a, a, a power lines, pylons, steel, you know, those, I don't know what they call them in Canada. What do they call them over there? Just pylons. The pylons, the big... <laughs> yeah, just yeah. pylons. He would yeah. the board, you know, just to get that, you know. And so then it would go into the computer and he'd play that on stage, that sound. Mm. He would, you know... Some of those costumes... Like, some of those costumes he wore were just... I, I saw a picture of him once with nothing but pyramids on. He had a pyramid hat and the whole thing looked oh, like a big... Oh, his costumes were dress. insane. Like yeah. way back in Genesis, he yeah. wore this one that looked like a it was uh, the slipper man, like herpes. It was just the like man, yeah, bubbles yeah. and shit, and he couldn't yeah. be heard <laughs> through the mud. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but I mean, did he, going back to it, he, Tony Levin uh, is, in my opinion, probably one of the best live bassists I've ever seen. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, obviously, what he's famous for is that stick. You know, Stick piece. Um, yeah, I couldn't believe it when I first. He, he was the first guy I ever seen playing one of those. You know, and we've actually got a such little a clip. nice guy as well. That's why they gel. You've got Tony there, Peter and David Rhodes. Yeah, They're yeah. all such nice guys. They are, you know, they those are rock stars. 
you know, but they say thank you and please. They don't make demands on anybody. And, Did you, you know, get to work with Manu Kache when he was drumming? No, no. Uh, Jerry Marotta was the, the drummer. Jerry, okay. In my time. Yeah. Good language. drummer, though. Great drummer. Yeah. Well, he, he would walk in the studio and Peter would have left him with one cymbal and a snare drum and say, yeah. right, I want you to play this track. Well, he taught. He got, he got, he got so Phil cool. Collins to remove all these symbols. To, to just no symbols, no symbols. He would, he would. He would remove all the kit and leave him with one drum and a cymbal and say, yeah. "I want you to play it now on nows." Yeah. And this guy will clip to You know. I bet he was. Hey, it made it easier for the drum sounds. He made them play different ways and different. Th you know, got think about it in a different mm. manner. Made it well, easier that's what the led sorry, in the Gary, studio. Sorry, Gary, I was, I was just Yeah, saying go something. ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just going to say it made it easier for the drum tech, though, didn't it, Mal? <laughs> <laughs> One well, drum if you recall, uh, and I don't know if you knew about this, Brian, that uh, it was while they were recording the Melt album that led to an accident with one of the microphones that was being used. It was for inner studio communication that picked it up the drumming in such a way that led to In the Air Tonight. Hmm. It changed wow. the way the drums sounded. Yeah. When they heard yeah. it, they're like, oh, we got to capture that. And that led, <laughs> and he used it on um, Intruder was where it got used. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to play a little clip. Uh, there's not many clips of that tour uh, available on YouTube. I've never seen an official video or anything, but there is this, this, there's a few clips. Take me home. Or not take me, I'm sorry. Uh, what was it called? Salisbury Hill. Salisbury Hill. Yeah. Salisbury Hill. Yeah. Salisbury Hill. Fast yeah, I love the, the stage setting with the, the cubed light lights. Yeah, because uh, th that stage set was to represent the Giants Causeway. Oh, right, yeah. The in Northern Tandle. Ireland. In Northern yeah, Ireland, yeah. They're off Tandle shapes and different levels, so you would. There was all kinds of levels of the, the stage, yeah. you know. And I, I may be wrong, but I've never been able to find a really good quality video of this tour. Uh, uh, Pete, I know, it's hard to get. It's just it's like there was no official days. film. Yeah. yeah. But you can get a feel of it here. Yeah. And the light tubes, you know, that used yeah. to change. Yeah. And uh, so this was the first tour you did with them, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> who was who was the uh, set decorator for that? Uh, well, um, my um, myself and Albert. I call really? Albert Lawrence. Yeah. I thought that's for one fantastic design. I thought for one horrible moment yeah. you were going to say Albert Hall. <laughs> <laughs> There's Tony. Yeah. Yeah, with that stick. So you, these Larry guys were Fast, were Larry Fast on keyboards. He was a oh, New Larry Jersey Fast. boy, yeah. and he used to do all the Bon Jovi stuff, all the early Bon Jovi keyboard stuff. Yeah, yeah. So Larry these guys Fast. were great to work with. You know, in your view, they they were a pleasure to work. Fantastic, with. fantastic. I used to stand out the side of the stage, and I think I'll just watch Tony tonight, or I'll just watch Peter, or I'll just watch, you know, what any one of them. I just watched one part of the show, and just used to enjoy it so much. Mm. You you did get to have those Peter moments then my, where, where my wedding and danced with my mother at my wedding. Oh wow! So, mm. so but you were able to do that. <laughs> just you could actually remove yourself temporarily as part of the show and just yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, I love that. That's great. Yeah, just. 
that is one of the shows where I would do make a point of doing that. You know, hmm. other shows, you know, I would disappear backstage or something, go and sit in the production office. Yeah, but so uh, this time though, this was a very different environment from the one you'd started out in the early seventies. A lot bigger, a lot more equipment. Oh, yeah. Well, what year yeah. did you start with Peter? Uh, that would have been seventy nine eighty. Okay, so, so the you yeah. you got in there after he was going through that really odd period where some of his vocals he sounded like Kermit the Frog. He would hit this uh thing in his voice. Yeah. It, oh, yeah, 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 He got a grip on it, and and he got control of it. <laughs> I don't know what was going on there, with Peter. You know, he was going through a funny phase of his life, and well, he's trying to also understand that. what his vocals were going to be like. He was trying to figure it out. You could feel it in his music. Yeah, but you got in there uh, just a, in the right a time. Lot of, a lot of what Peter does, like I said earlier, depends on his mental state. At that time, so, and I don't think he was in a good place. So he's, and, and that's why you get the shaved head, and things like mm. that. Is it's kind of a punishment. Do you think, for, well, that's partly because of the, the the financial difficulties with Walmart, or? No, no, I don't think that was. It could have been. It could have been all kinds of things. But I know there was one side of it that was particularly stressful for him yeah well it was stressful for everybody else around him as well uh, well he is the star and i, I, and I don't is, really go into that I, it was personal sure sure it's personal well, and i don't really yeah. want to go into that but i mean still a very successful tour and a great relationship oh yeah and yeah fantastic you know the crowds sold out everywhere we went you know it was just fantastic I like the lineup here for this gig, which is at Selhurst Park in in uh, Crystal Palace ground. I think, isn't it Selhurst Park? Uh, the Thompson yeah, Twins which, and the which, Undertones. Which, which, and the lived, undertones. Which, that was my local soccer <laughs> ground. That's that was my local team back then. That's what I thought. Yeah. Nice. Uh, that was I, I was I was able to drive home. I was home in fifteen minutes after the show. You know. Yeah. I do the like the fact that, that the ticket is eight pounds thirty with a thirty pence booking fee. <laughs> But no, eight pounds thirty. It'd be eight hundred pounds now for that gig. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, lovely, obviously lovely memories. But you would work. Was it through working with Peter that you ended up working with the rest of Genesis? Then uh, I started working with Peter first, and then Genesis were doing something. I can't remember what it was. They were doing some shows, and they just asked me if I could put a crew together for it for them. Uh, yeah. Which I did. Was it after yeah. Steve, uh, Steve Hackett left, or or while he was still with? Yeah, him? after uh, Steve had after. left. Yeah, yeah. It was probably the, uh, the. It was probably around the time of Duke. Oh yeah, which is one of my 1980, albums. 81, right That's in that area. the tour I first saw Genesis on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, been, yeah. yeah. Birmingham NEC Christmas yeah. Eve. And so I done some shows in England. I put a crew together for them, and and then. And then I just, you know, they just said, I got a call one day. And he, yeah. Do you want to come and do something more with them? Said, yeah. So I do have a question, Mal. Um, when you say putting a crew together, just at what exactly did that entail? Well, finding about 40 guys mm. <laughs> and transporting them around England. It was only in England uh, and, you know, shuffling Doing, you know, the tour manager thing, putting the, a crew together, stage and man picking up the crew. phone and calling guys you knew, or how did that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Experienced guys, guys I didn't even, you know, not didn't even know. Uh, somebody would say, "Yeah, can I? Do you mind? Can I bring him? Have you? Got, yeah, I just need to get this crew. As long as you can guarantee they'll work." So that yeah. was the road crew, but was somebody else taking at that point taking care of the sound and lighting and other aspects of it? Were you just yeah, on the road yeah. They had the, they had the key. They had the key guys in place. They needed, mm. you know, because yeah, in it, in England at the time we didn't really have the stagehand thing that they had going in in North America. Yeah. Yeah. So. What were the differences to you? I mean, when you first started going over to the US with bands, what were the big differences between the British scene and road management and the American scene? 
Well, there you go. You know, there was that stagehand thing, which was predominantly back then in the in the 70s when I first started touring America in the mm. main venues was, you know, teams to run, which was yeah. union. You know, union which was, was a big thing, yeah. Union was a big thing. You know, New York, Cleveland, you know, you could not touch the equipment. Mm. You, you, you would just have to point at it and let them do it. You know, and, like and if you touched it, <laughs> yeah. Because I guess in Britain, and you guys were used I, to doing everything. You'd pick everything up, you'd do so, you, If you had to be done, you would do it. Yeah, yeah, it was just quicker to do it that way, you know, rather than look for two stage hands. Oh, can you stack this, you know, stack yeah. these marshals on top of each other? No, yeah. oh, just do it. Yeah. Uh, I remember being in New York and we were playing. This might have been with Peter, actually. I think it was. Uh, and we were doing uh, Central Park, and I moved this gear in, and the union boss came to me. He was a really nice guy, as it turns out. And he said, do you know what this means? And he'd done the timeout thing. I'm trying to get that up there. He'd done the timeout thing. And I said, yeah, that means timeout. He said, so do you know what this means? And I said, no, what does that mean? He said, just a fucking minute. <laughs> Just, a... <laughs> Just a right. I've never so heard I was that trying before. to get things moving along. <laughs> never that heard that there's, before. There's that New York minute. Maybe that's what the Eagles uh, were singing about. You know, well, maybe yeah, yeah, New yeah, York yeah. minute. Yeah. That's incredible. I've never heard that one. But uh, just briefly, I'd like to thank everyone in the in the chat for being here and uh, for your keep your chats up and. <laughs> Keep keep get through questions in there, or whatever you know. And um, we've got a lot of a lot of stuff to cover. We kind of jumped forward, but we'll keep with the eighties because we're there already. So you yeah. all this great Peter Gabriel stuff, uh, and then came possibly one of the most momentous uh, occasions in rock history, which was Live Aid. Uh, yeah, uh, you must have a few memories of that. Yeah. I got I got a video well, to play. I have, I mean, there's other, other bits I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I got a so so you um, were you yeah. were intimately involved with with Live Aid through Phil Collins and, and some other bits and pieces. I am actually going to play a little clip that I put together of Phil Collins and Live Aid. And if everyone in the audience in the panel looks very carefully at the first ten seconds, you'll see a certain Mal Craig's uh, in here. So. Let's uh, let's watch this. Where's the dress? Yeah. Uh, there he is, the man himself. <laughs> You're gonna love that oh, phone call. It's mullet. Yeah, the mullet. But he shouts for Mal, and Mal because he needs to know. Mal needs to tell him where to go. So Phil did. He did. He I love it when he screws up on the piano here. Yeah. I don't have a, I have to keep the clip short, guys. Oh, okay. But Phil did screw up on the chords. So then he goes to Heathrow to get Concord to go to America. Now, you were with him on the helicopter, Mal, is that right? Yeah, I was with him all the way from first thing in the morning. We, we took a helicopter from Battersea Power Station from the River Thames yeah. into Wembley. We'd done the show in Wembley, uh, then, onto another helicopter to East Airport, onto so Concord, uh, to New York. Was Noel, Ed, was Noel Edmonds flying that helicopter? Noel Edmonds, British TV no. presenter? No. Okay. No. 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 <laughs> and across the tarmac, there he is, and there's Concord waiting for him. And then you got on Concord too, and there was radio interviews and stuff. And then he played, he got to America, you played. He played with, he done radio interviews. He played with Eric. You know, I cannot remember that. It's only seen his footage. And there he is, right there. Oh, I don't remember that. Questions on a plane, but I enjoyed. I enjoyed doing it. I, I wanted to come and play with Eric because I mean we're neighbours, we're great buddies, and I just wanted to play. I wanted to play the drums, so I came here to play with him. I wanted to play with Robert and Jimmy, and I played with him, and I did my two songs that I know. 
and uh, it was great fun. I mean, uh, you know. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce some friends of mine to you. Would you welcome Mr. Robert Plant, Mr. Jimmy Perry, Mr. John Paul Jones, Mr. Gary Tucker. So you were there through the entire thing with Phil. I guess you didn't see anything else other than do what you were doing yeah. with him. I was there too. Yeah, <laughs> you were in Philadelphia. That's right. Courtney was in Philly at that gig. I was a little oh, girl. Oh, yes. Oh. Look at you. Yeah. Hey, Courtney. Yeah, I have to have um, headphones plugged into my phone now, apparently, to have anything work. So I just tried everything. I yeah. apologize. Hey, you feel like shitting any uh, honest drummers again today? Oh, yeah. I do. <laughs> Courtney's a, a bass player, so she's got a thing about drummers, and Gary's a drummer. Hi, Mel. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm a drummer pianist, just like Phil. <laughs> yeah. how, how do you get a drummer to stop playing? The, uh, the, bass, player and, the bass player and the drummer making fun of each other. Meanwhile, we're just sitting there like, oh, the special kids are fighting again. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's okay, fuck you, Pope. <laughs> so, 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 so hang on. So Mal... What's your favorite drummer joke, if you can remember one, or any musician joke? <laughs> I don't think I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, guess you've heard so many. I don't, you know, I, we, I didn't have jokes about them, you know. Yeah. But what were, was it like they seeing that? The, they were my salary. I couldn't make jokes about them. No. <laughs> well, you have worked with some amazing drummers. So which one would you uh, consider to be the best? Who do you consider the best drummer Ooh. you ever worked with? Can't pick They're favorite. all so different. You know, I get asked this a lot about different musicians. Who's the best guitar player? Who's the best player? Who's the best drummer? Who is your favorite? But I went, oh, you know, because I personally like the guy so much. Alan White from Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Very. Oh, yeah. Mm. I was thinking oh, you were I get it. Say Nick Mason. Sadly you know, departed. Alan, Alan was such a nice guy. You know, and we lost him a year or so Sadly ago. Sadly departed, yeah. I uh, made a video at the time about it. Such a shame. And, and I, I knew him long before I, I worked for him. I knew Alan for a long time. Because mm -hmm. I, I lived in, in Oxfordshire at the Manor Studios. And he, he lived just down the road, so we used to hang out a little bit. Wow. One of the nice guys. Yeah, yeah, great guy, great drummer. I saw yes a couple of you times. Know, and then Jerry Marotta was a fantastic drummer. Oh, Phil, yeah. obviously, Chester, Chester Thompson. You know, yeah, you got to work, because was, that was when he joined, wasn't it, the, the Duke tour? That was his first yeah. tour. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. with um, the uh, guitar... Uh, Daryl Sturmer. Daryl Sturmer. I can never pronounce Darryl. Sturmer yeah, properly. Darryl Darryl. Sturmer. So, yeah. Um, can so, I yeah, shout out something really, like, while we're talking it. about this? Because drummers, I think Nicholas Mason was the drummer for Pink Floyd. Nick and you were Mason. talking about it before. Um, this is a shirt my dad gave me from like a from the wall tour. Look at the cigarette birds. <laughs> <A cigarette. laughs> is it a cigarette though? Was it a cigarette? No, I'm sure it not. wasn't. My dad has never smoked cigarettes in his life, so I don't know why I said that part because I used to smoke. <laughs> but um, I don't know if you can see it. It's the wall. It's, it's a baseball team. I think it's really old. I was going to wear it, but I'm afraid to wear it. <laughs> Very nice, Courtney. Very nice. So, so, I got uh, oh, Go ahead, Joe. I just I got a question for Mal uh, at, at uh, about Live Aid. Um, I saw it a month yep. later, and I just I got to ask, how messed up was uh, uh, Mr. Page? Or, you know, I mean. Uh, the guitar player Jimmy. from Led Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Page. Yeah, Jimmy Page. How Zeppelin, messed up was yeah. he? Because he looked like he was drooling on the cassette I saw. I mean, it, it yeah, looked but like he, he was really he could, be, he, he could be drooling and he's dead straight. Yeah, you know, really? Wow. <laughs> it has yeah. to be said that Zeppelin, like Zeppelin, you know, Zeppelin... We, we used to... Now, that is one joke we used to say. Uh, how do you know when Jimmy's he's 
straight. He drools out of both sides of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and you said Zeppelin's performance was not no, the best that day. You know, no, uh, it, 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 it you could good. tell by uh, Robert's face, he didn't really look like he wanted to be on stage with that guy at all. <laughs> he kept cutting eyes well, at him. So, Pope, were you going to say something there? Sorry. So, well, I mean, we say the same joke about Gary all the time. Like, how can you tell if the drum, if, if the uh, drum riser is level, if the drummer drools equally at both sides, both sides of his <laughs> uh, Before I got to go, and I hate this, Mal, because it's so wonderful meeting you. Uh, but there was something when I was first started drumming is that uh, I think I was 14 when I started drumming in a band and I listened to the, oh my God to the who and I'm sitting with a bunch of guys, other musicians and they said, man, Keith Moon, what a drummer. I said, he's not a great drummer. He's insane. Yeah, I said, I that? don't know what he's doing half he's the time performer though. Oh, he's ins <laughs> he was insanely good. But the thing is, is like I sometimes question his skill in just purely being bravado and insane on drums. He would do things that just blew my mind that just like yeah. I would have never thought of doing or any of my drummer friends would have thought of doing. Well, if, if you look at Mitch Mitchell, he looks like he's, he's not keeping any time whatsoever. He looks like he's just bashing away. Yeah. But when you play with somebody like Hendrix, you haven't got mm. much choice there, you know. True, and yeah. with Pete... Townsend doing what he was doing with the guitar, you know, smashing his gear to pieces and microphone stands, you know, his bottom see. neck. You just got to bash away, you know, and just keep something going. But didn't That's Pete say that he, he could never get Keith to play four or four time? He just couldn't do it. No, because he, he was, I've always suspected. Was he really a drummer? <laughs> I just don't know. I've always been profoundly like freaked out by him. Like he's yeah. just crazy on those drums. And that's of course the inspiration for Animal on the Muppets mm -hmm. was Keith yeah. Moon. But uh, oh, he's also the one. Is it? Wasn't Keith Moon the one that started the whole breaking instruments before even Pete did it? Yeah. Well, he, he was annoying. Uh, annoying yeah. and just yeah. destroys drums. Yeah. yeah. Did you meet? You must have met Keith many times. I know you worked for oh, the you Who. You had much to have later. met him. You worked for the Who much later, two thousand era. But yes, you must have yeah. met Keith. And many Zach Starkey oh, really? was the, Zach Starkey yeah. was the drummer. Yeah, he's and oh, he's Ringo's great son. Drummer. Ringo's son is yeah. great. Yes. Yeah, yeah, he's the best drummer in their family. Him and <laughs> Phil Collins, boy, both amazing drummers. Yeah. 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 Have you got any specific memories of Keith Moon that you can share? That's what I wanted before I go. I wanted to hear a Keith Moon memory. You know, my my wife my wife knew him much more than I did. Uh, okay, yeah. Get her on here. No. Well, <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. There's, there's a good comment in the chat. He's got, from, he's got a whole set of stories from, you know, hanging out at uh, Pete Townsend's house in Richmond. It's, it's, it's called The Wick. Uh, Ronnie Wood used to own it. And then Pete Townsend bought this house and it was like party central back in the day. You, you know, he, uh, mm. Zach used to tell me, you know, they'd wake up and might have belonged to, and there'd be Hendrix asleep on the sofa or, you know, mm. anybody, you know, just anybody who was anybody that was party central. You know, just like to say hi to CC karaoke, our great friend. Good to see you, buddy. My that was the Canadian I was friend. Bring up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope and I'm going to get out of here, but it was a great honor meeting you, uh, Mal. God, it, it really is. Uh, just so nice you know, talking to you. It was great meeting you, talking to you, and I am a huge Gabriel and and uh, Pink Floyd and Genesis fan, and The Who. Those were my favorite bands growing up, man. Uh, yeah. God bless you for coming on here, and thank you so much for uh, befriending uh, Brian. Uh, that 70s rock somebody band, has to none of us like him we don't <laughs> know what's you yourself. He's, one of my, he's my favorite <laughs> he's one of my best friends too shut up courtney you don't know shit <laughs> and i Thanks, love you Dad. courtney I know. dustin all you guys in paradise joe pulp uh john yeah. everybody have a great day today and god bless you malcolm thanks for being here man take care gary and thanks Bye, for having me brian see you, soon. Guys. see you gary see you soon beat it so we can talk
There we go. That's better. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I wanted to go back to to, to live. It first of all, though, just for that, thanks to everybody for being here on, on YouTube and on Rumble, and watching and sharing and liking, and yeah, just keep those chats coming and questions from Mal if you've got yeah. any. Um, we're doing pretty well over in Rumble. I know a lot of people are watching. They tend not to chat over there though, which is kind of weird. But um, we got something going on on uh, the YouTube stream seventies. I don't know Some, if it's my end or what. It's just buffering. Uh, I don't know because I don't watch it when I'm streaming. It looks fine on my end. Yeah, it's fine. I just needed a refresh. I just want to make sure we weren't getting hit again for something. No, we're like, good. Man. I'm we're in good. the studio part, and it's okay so far. We haven't had any warnings or anything. Uh, I know we're on the front page on Rumble now, though, so that's good. I didn't get to see it. I didn't get to see it live like Courtney, but I did watch the entirety of Live Aid while it happened. Well, I so say I, I, I was awake either. the whole time. Well, I, I watched it in the middle of a million people. Yeah, I was stuck on an movie. island in the middle of the damn ocean in the army, guarding chemical weapons for a year. Wow. Yeah, my dad sent it to me out on uh, on VHS. About a well, month later, I watched it. Yeah. Like I've never seen. Seen. Go ahead, John. Sorry, somebody said something. Else. Anyway, oh, it was Mal. I was going to say oh. that I saw it like all British people. I watched it all in the pub. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, but yeah, you're making it. So you must have had a, did you know it was a huge thing when you were in it? No, no, no. Uh, we just finished touring with Genesis and the manager said, right, this is going to happen. Phil's going to do both sides, sort mm. it out, you know, and I said, what do you mean, sort that? Get, get, you know, coordinate it for Phil. Mm. Uh, and it was, I had 10 days, and that was probably the hardest 10 days of my life. You know, it was exhausting. It totally exhausting. You know, like Imagine. I say, started early in the morning, flying in there. He went on stage early because he had to go on stage early so he could fly over to the US mm -hmm. and and then down to Philly and do his thing there, you know. So we had to be on stage early in London. Yeah, uh, and I remember the the the, the thing the, there and his thing. when he's on Concord in those days <laughs> they couldn't do any kind of video. There was radio interviews with him, but there was no video, yeah. just over the mm -hmm brought the radio from the plane yeah uh, yeah it was that, it was so was it. I know. compared to now it would be like full on internet whatever then it was yeah so cool. <laughs> here on concord <laughs> so was it a full plane was the concord full i mean did they ever well, ab it? absolutely absolutely you know everybody every, but it was nearly all journalists you know i thought you said his wife didn't there, make, his wife wasn't that there. woman because it never been done before you know mm. one artist Two continents, same day. You know, it was just yeah. an, an amazing thing to be part of. Uh, that's why I don't remember things like ever being seeing Phil on stage with Eric. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where I wanted to put those clips together, especially with the clip of him and Eric, him with him and uh, Led Zeppelin, and you finding that clip of you was gold dust. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen that. I'd never seen that before. Somebody had <laughs> dyed my hair though. My hair it was a lot. Yeah, it was pretty short then. But, um, My so hair's bleached now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they Deliberate had two like. drummers play for uh, Bonham, didn't they? Wasn't Toby Thompson the other guy? It was Tony Thompson. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Uh, From Power Ford. Station. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah. they were right against each other. Yeah. yeah. Zeppelin swore they would never release the footage of that. Yeah. Mm. I know that uh, uh, Phil Collins said in an interview that, that, Eric and um, Robert Plant had told them when you're playing, they both said, "Like if you don't know what don't know what you're playing, just lay off. Don't do, don't play anything." Yeah. So, see, sometimes I was just going like this. He wasn't really hitting anything because he wasn't sure where he was. It's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> wow. sadly surprising, you know, the, the old jet yeah. lag. You know, I even this. Sorry, Mal. Sorry. No, yeah, even, with, the, even with you know the jet lag and everything with Concord, but we were back back home in London in time for lunch on Sunday. You wow. know, you know what a twenty four hours. Yeah, I like to ask Courtney 
it looked really hot that day in Philly. That's one of the things I remember. I remember my yeah. mom was in her like she was an aerobics teacher, so she looked very eighties. <laughs> like she had like her little like <laughs> short shorts and her leotard top on. I don't even know. Maybe a tube top. Like warmers. Like yeah, warmers? not in that weather. It was hot, and my <laughs> little brother was in a stroller, and I was probably like what was it, eighty four? So I was six, six years old, and I just remember ending up having to sit with my brother. Like I was babysitting my brother, but that's what you did in the eighties. A six year old was totally allowed, you know, <laughs> to babysit a baby. And my mom would just take off. And we were on the ground with just all these people around us sweating and hot. And I remember being able to hear the music. And all I really recognized at the time was uh, Bruce Springsteen. Hmm. Hmm. I seem to recall the Philly gig was not nearly as good as the London one. That's just maybe no. my British bias. I, I I found it. I found the 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 London uh, the London one. In general, all the performances were much tighter. For what I watched, thing, I agree. The whole thing was much tighter, which I would have expected the American one to be much tighter. Mm, you know, why, why is that? Why you know, you I don't know. It American? was just. I don't know where it was because normally when you do things like that, they are they they, they run much slicker than they would be in England, you know. But I yeah, found the English one run so much better. Yeah, was interesting. Better, better organized. Whether they had less time to organize it, whether it was a after all, oh, let's do it in America as well. Mm, it's because know, it was in so Philly. Maybe the run up was <laughs> <It's> in Philly. <laughs> That's why they did that, in Philly. That was the, the my first visit to the United States oh, was boy. Philadelphia. I flew in Philadelphia. I'd done a show at the Tower Theatre. Oh my goodness. I saw, the Stones, that with, I saw the Stones at Tower and that tiny little that Tower Theatre. Yeah. Was that with well, me? I was working with Robert Palmer and Elkie Brooks. Uh, and yeah. we opened the show for the Velvet Underground. Oh, wow. wow. I saw the remotes there, too. Tower School. Wow. So yeah, the wonderful Robert Palmer. Well, I love Robert Palmer yeah. deeply. Met him. I did meet him once backstage. He's a lovely, lovely guy. Brilliant guy. Yeah, um, and he's uh, from the same part of the world as I'm from. You know, in the northeast. He's from northeast, but he was more Yorkshire, wasn't he? Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah he's from a, a little town called Redka. Ah, uh, Redka. You know, yeah. Horse racing there. Uh, Redka. Horse That's racing. That's where he was from originally. Yeah, Vinegar Joe and Robert Palmer, which was nice way guy. Back. Nice guy. Yeah, I I wanted to play another clip. That, that everyone's going to have to indulge me here from Live Aid, the very opening song of Live Aid, because it's a band you worked with and your good lady wife worked with, the Magnificent yeah. States Quo. So I'm going to subject you all to this. I love it. I love this. These guys know nothing about the Quo, but I love the Quo. So. Oh, oh this fantastic. Oh, Fantastic. Wow. Like an institution in the UK. I never made it in the States, but a total institution in the UK. And uh, all, virtually all gone now. Deceased, unfortunately. Two, two, of, two of the front three I have. Yeah, the, the uh, yeah. Lancaster and uh, Alan Lancaster and Rick uh, uh, Francis Rossi. Uh, Rick, Rick Parfitt. Rick Parfitt yeah. gone, yeah. But, uh, Huge band, but it's a very symbolic opening with rocking all over the world, which Joe might recognize as a John Fogerty song. Yep. Yeah. You know that one. I'm just struck every time I see footage from this, how many people were in that stadium. That is just well, yeah. wow. Yeah, it's plus, amazing. Plus. Yeah. I've been to a gig there. I saw the Stones there once. I say I saw them. I couldn't see a damn thing. I was fixed to say, but could you? I couldn't see anything. <laughs> 
Better bring binoculars. That's how I felt at Live Aid. Yep. Yeah, but <laughs> I love the cool. You, this were, the... you were physically present. <laughs> yeah, so it was physically the present. They played, uh, our, they played here in Indianapolis a couple years ago after not playing here for like 15, 20 years. And they yeah. played uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which holds like 500,000 people. And oh, uh, right. I wanted to go. Wow. Like, even that tickets were like two, three hundred dollars. Mm. That's incredible. It's too much, though. I mean, you could, I mean, you wouldn't be able to see him. He'd be so far back with like that many people. It'd be crazy. Yeah. So you worked with Quo for a while, though, um, and your wife certainly did, uh, Mal. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, that's how we met. I was uh, working for them. Um, we, we rocking all over the world tour. Oops. And uh, we went to Australia, and uh, that's it. That's the album. Yeah. No. And, uh, what, what my wife, like? my wife had quit the music business. She was taking like time out from it, and she mm. went to live in Australia. And she came along to the concert, and we said hello, and that was about it. Uh, and mm. forty-five years on. <laughs> <laughs> So status quo, <laughs> the quo brought you together, isn't that touching? They did, they did. I love. The I used to look after all those, all those AC thirties at the back there. Oh, we had yeah. thirty of those. Jesus, you know. <laughs> they were a pretty loud, raucous band. I mean, you mentioned before the the famous gig at the Glasgow Apollo, where the balcony was going up and down. Yeah, three feet. yeah, the balcony. The yeah, the, 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 yeah, that yeah. The, the, just. You know, like when army marches across bridges, they have to break stride for the you know suspension bridges so they don't make them bounce too much. Yeah. But the core just made everything bounce in time. Yeah, the, you know, the audiences went nuts. I've seen them a number of times back in the day, and it was just like a party, huge party, rocking by a good boogie band. Oh. Uh, sadly, underrated. Yeah, in the US, fantastic. But what can you do? Um, yeah, did, yeah. So I did. Want to flip back if uh, everybody's okay to to the Genesis era, if you guys are okay with that. Davina Duckworth had a question about Live Aid Ooh, before you get too far away from it. Oh, she was right, asking, yeah, sorry. yeah, go ahead, Julia. Yeah, she was asking, uh, was there much time for rehearsals at Live Aid? That big a show with that many no uh, talent, yeah. No, well, as far as Phil was concerned, none whatsoever. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I don't know about any of the others, but with Phil, he didn't do any rehearsal time. You know, it was basically on stage. You know, you, did you hand him the piece of paper with that he was carrying when he went on in London the first for the first? Uh, he had a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. that's his set list. <laughs> set list, two songs, some lyrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Sting comes on. There's another one. You're yeah. off. We're off. But as he said, Helicopter. The, the Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. stuff, they said, oh, they might have done an hour or two of rehearsals over the phone or something, and he, he had no he had no chance to rehearse with any of them. talked to Robert. He'll have talked to Robert, for sure, and he'll have talked to Eric, you know, uh, about what they were going to do, but that was it. There wasn't no mm -hmm. form of rehearsal. No. He knew the songs. Yeah. Well, they played no. them a thousand times, yeah. Um, yeah. Welcome you know, to FDC 2005. So. He toured with Robert, you know, and he toured with Eric. So he knew the guys well. He knew their music, so. Um, yeah. that. They, they just feel it's like muscle memory. It was the same with The Who, though, at uh, the British part of Live Aid. They, they said they rehearsed over the phone for 20 minutes. <laughs> Over the phone back then? Oh yeah, my gosh, wow. Yeah, that'll do, you know. <laughs> I think it's really cool too that you literally you know literally weird cool. technological eras too where you couldn't do that now because they stopped running the Concord in like the late nineties. Oh yeah. 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 So yeah. it's like this is the only period where that could have happened. Because it ran from like nineteen seventy eight to like nineteen ninety something. Yeah, the Concord was a wonderful invention, but because it was a French-British thing, I don't think the American um, airlines liked it. The Americans much. weren't fond of it at all because they wouldn't. They were supposed to go, originally supposed to go to Los Angeles, but they wouldn't allow it to overfly um, mm. the U.S. because it was, you know, supersonic. They had nothing to catch it at mm. the time. 
So they didn't know what it was coming into so their, their space. Like they went, this something's doing Mac 2, you know, yeah. and we I can't catch it. Yeah. You know. I guess you could do SpaceX now if you were going to do it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the chat. A lot of people have joined. Thanks, Davina, for that question. I mean, please put more questions in and comments. Uh, FKHC2005. Um, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. I see a lot of great comments looking back uh, over the chat. And uh, those that are watching over in Rumble, and there are a few, leave a chat. Talk to us. That would be lovely because we have this wonderful, wonderful guest, Mr. Marl Craggs. Um, I mean, live aid, incredible. Just what an experience. But you also did an awful lot of work with with another one of my favorite trios, Pink Floyd being one of them because they were a trio. Yeah. <laughs> when we were, and then Genesis, you, you had a number of tours with Genesis. Uh, was that working? I mean, you were working for Phil and Genesis, or just Phil, or how did that work? Oh no, no, I worked for when I done Phil. I worked for Phil when I worked for Genesis. I worked for Genesis. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and this yeah. was again tour management, or was it production management? Yeah, tour, tour management. Yeah, because right. these were big tours. I mean, they had a big yeah, yeah. Who, who remembers that Genesis commercial on MTV? It was like. How well do Genesis know each other? And it was like so well that we they were all finishing like each other's yeah, sentences. Right, yeah. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> That's like I, my I, I have seen it. Yeah, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, but they, these must have been these were in they were at their commercial peak. They kind of moved past a lot of the prog stuff from doing a lot of pop hits. I guess yeah. these were like ninety hundred thousand arenas, uh, seater arenas. Yeah, like oh, I've got I've got a double a double disc somewhere not somewhere in the house yeah. and and the tour I did uh, seven, 86, 87 uh, we played uh, to 3.4 million people on that world tour wow, wow. Yeah. serious numbers yeah. yeah just like a machine though by then I guess you were yeah, I guess you were in the city, but you had a, a bunch. You must have sent people ahead to the next city. Was it like a leapfrog thing, or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, production-wise, I think we had, uh, especially in Europe, I think we had three stages, two mm. roofs, three stages. Jeez. So there was one stage being built, one stage being used, one stage being torn down. Yeah, that's quite uh, production. Wow. They were leapfrogging each other. You know. mm -hmm. Incredible. Just to, to, for, when you consider yeah. the transit van days to that. Notice what it says well, at the bottom well. of the uh, flyer. Is that because people yeah. would expect maybe just Phil Collins? Or it says, please note Genesis will perform the entire concert. It could be. Oh, no. That, 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 that's stipulated. No, there's no opening kind no of band. Opening act, no support act. Yeah. Gotcha. No opening okay. act. That's you know, I guess just, a, the entire show. but I guess yeah. they were doing a, a two-hour show at least. I mean, two to three hours minimum. Or at least two, yeah, yeah, two to three hours. Yeah, same as Floyd. You know, because most of their hours. songs lasted for three hours, forty sure. minutes, right? <laughs> um, I think this one might be Australia. I'm not sure. That's the Invisible Touch uh, tour. I'm not sure. Yeah, Paul, Paul Dante. Yeah, that's definitely. If it's Paul Dante, he's the man. Yeah promoter in Australia. I do have a clip of the Wembley 1996 gig. Again, Wembley Stadium, which was it's it's the old Wembley. There's a new one there now. I think they it tore was it the old, Yeah. But the, the, this was 100,000 people usually at these gigs. So. Yeah.
Yeah, so Abacab from that 86 Wembley gig. I mean, is it one night in Wembley or did you do multiples in those days? Four nights. Four nights, so about 400,000 people. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Did it make any difference to you the size of it, though? If it was like a 10,000 thing and a 100,000 thing, was it any different to you? No, not really. Not really. Maybe to the production crew, you know, the stage might have got a little bit bigger. The sound might have got a little bit bigger. But uh, generally for what my side of it, it was just, you know, maybe maybe another 200 guests that I had to sort out tickets for. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you, that's wow. right. so everyone would want a ticket for guests. I love too how you can tell just by the instruments what era it is. Like with that headless bass, I'm like immediately like, okay, this is late '80s. That's the '80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was that when Mike Rutherford had this thing that, where he would play anything recorded before Steve Hackett left. He would play bass on anything after he'd play guitar on. So he played yeah, both, yeah. depending on the era. Uh, because he wasn't the principal guitarist back in the day, he was the bass player. No, no, he never was. But you know, yeah. he's a fair, he's a fair, you know, he's he's a fair guitar player. You know, he's not a bad guitar player, but he's not a great guitar player. No, no, mm. he's probably not a great drummer either. But... <laughs> 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 yeah, so that must have been uh, exciting stuff. The working for Genesis Global Tours, and then of course you had a—I think it was slightly earlier—but you did the whole page and plant thing. Yeah, this was uh, ninety-five. I done Robert Plant, Jimmy Page, and that's mm. when we had uh, the nine Egyptian guys on tour with us as well. Mm. These Egyptian musicians. So it was, yeah. you know, when they played songs like Kashmir, you oh, yeah. know, it was just outstanding. Oh, yeah. You know, when yeah. they played Kashmir with that. I remember being in Philly and, and coming off, and Robert was really pissed with Jimmy. I don't know why, you know, he, he played something wrong. I'm not a musician, never have been. And so, you know, and I said, oh, oh, well, well, the audience loved it. You know, don't get into a fight about this because <laughs> the audience loved it. They don't mm. care if he played, you know, that little bit out somewhere, you know. I think it is because Jimmy used to slip in Stairway to Heaven, a little lick from Stairway <laughs> to Heaven every night, you know. The song yeah. Sorry, Courtney, what did you say? I said, can't you read the sign? No stairway to heaven. No stairway to heaven. <laughs> no stairway. <laughs> Robert was yeah. stairway. Well, a genuine draft, yeah. That was the... Uh, uh, a genuine draft. I've still got golf balls with that written on. Oh, wow. The beer of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John, you were going to say something? Oh, yeah, that's <clears throat> that's the tour I saw them on was the uh, uh, 95, the uh, No Quarter. Yeah, oh, wow. and uh, at, at Keel in St. Louis, and I drove yeah. 300 and some miles to go see him, and we drove back, and at the end of it, we were like digging through looking for change to get enough gas to get home oh, in my <laughs> truck. <laughs> Rock and roll. I love this poster. <laughs> I love this poster. It's just yeah. hilarious. Bill Graham. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Thanks. No, no. Oakland Coliseum. Go on. Send it. Mm -hmm. Tragically you hip. I remember seeing that one. Yeah, the Tragically yeah. Hip Canadian band. You may have been, you may, I don't know if it's from the same tour exactly, but. Uh, I think it probably was. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, um, with the Egyptian guys on stage, it must have made kind of like making it up in the back lane a little different because it's a lot of traditional instruments as it were yeah yeah some of them you know they were you know wired for sound you know like the violin guys mm. you know and the tablets were you know it was it was okay it worked really well you know uh, really mm. lifted the songs you know and, uh, and jimmy uh robert loved all that having those guys there oh he yeah. loves that world music thing in the yeah. the, the yeah. egyptian stuff i've actually do have a, a clip i mean i don't know how much we'll be able to play given youtube's uh, policies but uh, i do have yeah. a little clip of them uh, from glastonbury 
Oh, okay, I had, I had done that. Yeah, with the Egyptian yeah. guys. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to show a little bit of that. Um, this would be, uh, you mentioned Kashmir, which I, I did think I might have had in the opening. Anyway, uh, this is In the Evening, which is another track that works perfectly with that setup. But, um, Good like that. Yeah, Mal, did Robert Plant have a wind machine to blow his hair? No. No, because is that just the wind blowing in? <laughs> That's just the wind. That's all natural. <laughs> <laughs> Quarter of a million people. No, I love that drummer. Speaking of drummers, I love that drummer. Yeah, Michael. Who, who is that drummer? Oh. Guy called Michael. Uh, oh, God. I can't remember his surname. Look at the size of that bass drum. He had a very basic kit. Oh, oh, fantastic. But, but this track particularly works well with that. that, that uh, Egyptian musician set up in the evening because it's already written like that. I mean, if, on, in through the outdoor, it's got yeah. that mystical Middle Middle Eastern feel to it. So yeah, that's uh, that was from Glastonbury. So I guess. Yeah, yeah. Over the years, a lot. I've done uh, Reading in 1979 with Peter Gabriel. <laughs> mm, Reading, uh, that was a real mud fest. I, I probably done it. Yeah. Probably done it the year before, uh, or <clears throat> ten years before, with Robert Plant and Vinegar Joe, uh, Robert Palmer, yeah. Reading. If if yeah, is there, most if, festivals. So I mean, if you do a Glastonbury with Page and Plant, they're one of multiple acts. How different is that from controlling it all yourself, having to work with all these other bands and? It's very di it is very different, you know. I mean, you you're locked in on the time, you know, and you're doing your thing. Mm -hmm. The lights are not yours, you know. You just can. That's why I think they always insisted on not headlining because they just yeah. go in there, do their thing, get out. You know, mm -hmm. all lights. They don't have to worry about the lights, the production. Well, there's a point. Who tears the, down the lights at the end of the Neb, festival? You've done a show at Nebwitz like that, and it was the same there. Yeah. You know, and and I'd, I think I might have done it with Floyd. And yeah, they, they did at Nebworth. And I, I saw Queen at Nebworth in 86. Paul McCartney headlined it in the end, you know. Oh, right, yeah, I remember that one, yeah. But I did see yeah, Queen at Nebworth. No, Nebworth Robbins, it was a charity one, you know. Mm. Yeah, music, music charity he does, yeah. M music therapy, yeah. Yeah, who does tear the lights down? Who tears everything down at the end of the festival? Which crew? No, not ours. <laughs> not yours. <laughs> no, there's there's a festival crew. You know, there's uh, you have your you have your backline guys. You've yeah. got your LD, your monitor guy. You know, and and that's about it. You know, your out front sound. Can you remember the first festival you ever did? Did you say it was with Robert Palmer? Was that a vinegar? Drum? Probably, probably Reading Festival. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Thin Liz, Thin Lizzy were on there. That time I remember. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it must have been pretty primitive then, because festivals were in their infancy still. You would not believe it was like bare scaffolding boards for staging. You seen uh, that thing at, at the Stones in Hyde Park? And yeah. the Stones were like, you know, even then rock and roll royalty, and that that stage they were on just wouldn't get by these days, you know, Hang on. at all. You it's know, pretty it's rough just, and ready, isn't it? I mean, yeah, wow. you look at that, you know, it's very rough and ready. There's more people on the sides than what's. <laughs> and like and if you look at even, even at Woods, Woodstock, it's just scaffolding. <laughs> yeah, it's it scaffolding. is basic scaffolding, you know. Okay, the impression I got from these early shows is that, you know, these early stages, a lot of redneck engineering went into it. There's a lot of gaffer tape and a lot of just planks <laughs> that you stole from somewhere else. And people yeah. getting shot. I, I think that still goes on in a lot of places. <laughs> I didn't know what gaffer tape was till I went to America in 1972. There wasn't any in England. You were introduced to <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> 
Yeah, and it's it's like um, the all-purpose cure-all for everything. Yeah. <laughs> WD-40. If it's supposed duct to move and it doesn't, WD-40. If it's not supposed to move and it does, use duct tape. Yeah. <laughs> duct tape, that's right. But yeah, it's amazing how rudimentary it was. We were so used to sophisticated, multi-zillion dollar gigs now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and then uh, with Floyd, you know, which things opening up on stage, robots flying in, you know, Eggs and all of that, and... all of that, you know, all of that stuff whizzing around all over the place, lasers, this, you know, that was high tech. I mean, and that was in the mid eighties, the late eighties. So well, God knows like now it's way, way beyond me. Yeah. Yeah. But you saw, I mean, it must have put a progression from being just carrying a couple of amps in the oh, late yeah. 60s to tour managing yeah. multi-million dollar stadium concerts. Yeah. Oh. Did, did I you miss? ever stop to think about that? No, I never did. Didn't yeah. have time. <laughs> did I miss if you guys uh, talked about Slade? No, we haven't Sorry. talked about Slade yet. Because you were talking about the earlier time, so I was we're, wondering we're, if I missed it. jumped forward because Gary <laughs> wanted to talk about Peter Gabriel and, and uh, yeah, had, Gary had to leave. So we'd, gotcha. we'd, or, we're going to go back and talk about Slade because oh. like status quo, Slade are dear to my heart. Me too. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. Enough to get to mine. Yeah. Believe uh. me. <laughs> Sorry, Dustin, you were really was, no, like, yeah, It was fun it's though, like you know. That, Noddy, uh... Noddy and Dom were lovely guys, mm. you know. Uh, we're going to show a clip of them and we'll talk about them for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Dustin, you were going to say something? Sorry. It was like the, the progression from, you know, just throwing a couple of amps in the back of like an old van into these gigantic tours where you're probably having like 60, 70 semi trucks bring everything to town. And yeah. like you were saying with like, like with Genesis and all that stuff, where it was like three stage rotations where there's like yeah. one being set up, one being torn down, and one being played on. Oh, it's amazing. Talk about juggling. Wow. Yeah, I don't know how you did that's, that as tour manager. That's like a, a feat. That's intense. That's, I can't it's even imagine. It's a logistical nightmare. <laughs> Good it for does. you. It does. It's project management, though, really, Mal. I mean, you yeah. became a project manager. Yeah. Well, uh, the, a lot of it, when you get to that level, a lot of it is taken away from you because you don't have to think about the equipment, really. You've got a production manager. A mm. stage manager, you know, the, the advanced guys are doing all the staging. So you're yeah, kind of yeah. micromanaging all the managers. I'd yeah. imagine what, you're you're having what, to hire what, people that you trust too. Huh? Yeah. What became my my thing was just the band entourage and shifting them around. You know, which which could be up to fifty people. You know. Wow. Yeah, it's not just the band. You know, band it's entourage. It wasn't like four, mus and... four musicians jumping into a van and driving to the next <laughs> gig, you know. Was... So realistically, it was probably harder being in the van because you didn't have MapQuest. You didn't know where you were going. You didn't know, like, where all the gas stations were. And you're trying to run from city to city in these little vans trying to get in there to these giant productions that everything's kind of just handled from above. And you just got to wrangle your cats. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. But that took some wrangling, believe me. You know, a, 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 quick, a quick one. We done the Kingdom in Seattle. Oh, there you go, right? there you go. We done the. Pink, <laughs> with Pink, this was with Pink Floyd. Uh, the next show was in Vancouver, and we had a day off between. So we decided what we'll do: we'll do the run, we'll come off stage, we'll get in the bus, we'll drive up. To, to Vancouver overnight, you know, it's not too far away. Oh man, yeah, don't get me started about Seattle. Oh, <laughs> so, so going across the border to Canada, well, though, got, and so I stopped the bus. You know, I found a, a, a bus company that would take us up there because we didn't, we didn't have a tour bus, we were flying, we had a, a you know, a, a mm. private jet, but that the guys were down, they couldn't fly that night anywhere. You know, because they'd already flown. Did you have so, musicians that were afraid to fly, ever? Like that you had sorry? to get. Did you ever have? Did you ever have musicians that were afraid to fly? Oh yeah, Tony Banks from Genesis. 
We yeah. had trouble. He, he was he didn't like flying at the best of times, and if we ever had a helicopter in and out of anywhere, it was really give him a bottle of sake, <laughs> pour it, <laughs> get him you numb, know, right? <laughs> yeah, knock him like, out, right? He he's loves like a shot of sake. He's like the yeah. Mister T of Genesis. I, guess. <laughs> I was very <laughs> <thinking, right? laughs> You get him on a helicopter. You know, yeah. he, he just did not like helicopters at all. Yeah. He, he wasn't the best flyer, but he didn't like helicopters. Helicopters are yeah. not. I'm not. I'm, I don't like heights, and helicopters freak me out. I can be in a plane. Oh, no problem. Helicopters are different. They're scary. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay oh, with helicopters as long as they're not firing, they firing missiles fly. at me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pope. Go ahead. So helicopters are great until you realize they don't actually fly. No, no. They, they just controlled falling. Exactly. Yes, like, it's controlled yeah. falling. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, so uh, without giving too much away, Mal, I mean, you mentioned Tony Banks and flying, but you've worked with so many musicians. Were there any others that had peculiarities or superstitions or anything on tour that well, you had uh, to do? The bass player from Yes, Chris, Chris he liked to sit in a particular Squire. seat. Chris yeah. Squire, he liked to sit in a particular seat. On the plane. So did Gary. So did Gary Moore from you know. This is on the plane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and then this one time, Chris, who was always late for everything, he was late for everything. I left him behind. We we'd done Auburn Hills, outside up from uh, Detroit. Oh yeah, Michigan, yeah. Ob yeah. Auburn Hills, mm -hmm. and he he wouldn't come out of his room in the morning. We were leaving. We had to go back to Detroit Airport to get on the plane, which was a scheduled flight. Uh, so I just left him. I left a driver outside. Said I'm taking the rest of them. Get them checked onto this flight. <coughs> mm. They were literally closing the door. He kind of kicked the door open, you know, and and they come on the flight, and I was sitting in his seat. That he normally <laughs> has. Oh shit! Yes. <laughs> but we, we were literally pulling away. We we were getting ready to pull away from the gate. That's how mm. late it was. You know, the door was closed, and they banged on it, and they opened it up, and he come running on. We didn't do and that now. Wouldn't be he's a big and I'm mm -hmm. sitting in his seat at the front, you know, because he liked row two, and that was where he sat, aisle, row two. Uh, and he slapped me on the top of the head. And he's a big guy. He got great he big hands. And he whacked me across the top of the head. Mm. As we're pulling away, and he's walked to the back of the plane to find a seat. I was livid. I was livid. You were in his seat. <laughs> and we, by this time, we've pulled away from the gate and we're moving down. Mm. You know, we're on, the, we're taxiing, and I run down the plane and grabbed him by the throat. You know, I was just, and the 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 cabin crew came and went, sit down, otherwise we're going to have to arrest you. You know, right? <laughs> so I went back to my seat, but I was livid with him. You know, I was ready to. So what happened yeah. later? Yeah, it was, he, he apologised, you know, he apologised. Mm. He knew he was wrong, out of order, you know, because he wouldn't go out of bed. And I would have off. thought most bands would have been a bit afraid to tangle with their road crew or road... road. <laughs> hey, Nazareth, yeah. being Scottish, they used to like a drink. Hey. You know, Nazareth. that can come as a... Uh, you know, and... After the shows, they used to like to drink a lot of sake. I don't know why. You know. Well, and it's then, a pure spirit. They, it's better for you. And it's then better. if they couldn't find anybody to fight with, they'd fight each other. You know, <laughs> They were crazy, those guys. Uh, I know Nazareth. a couple of bands like that. <laughs> Nazareth, yeah. Yeah, great band. Love Nazareth. Absolutely yeah. Great band. Hear the dog. All that stuff. It, uh, that, was, that would have been a good double bill. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. Thing, is he? Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's probably I'll one say of your Patrick's shows. Day even? Whoa. Yeah. Oh, oh God, that's even worse. Well, Leah was born like 30 <laughs> years before. No, 20 before. <laughs> See, um, good Scottish teeth there. 
Some. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got some. Some, they've got some, yeah. They have still got some. Like yeah. that but um, sorry, Nazareth, yeah, fantastic band. Um, we, we were, um, I'm just gonna, I want to fl flip back because you know, you see, time is limited to a certain extent and go back to Pink Floyd again because we never, um, really talked about the whole Venice thing, all right. So that must have been a hell of an experience, the, the Venice gig. I've actually got a little bit of a, a video <laughs> to share of, of just, it's a little promo clip for the, the television broadcast of it. It went uh, live. It was broadcast live in England. Yeah, it was live on in Europe and then later on shown on recording in PBS, but it was live in, in yeah. Italy. The Italians love prog rock. They love Genesis. Yeah. Oh, they love yeah. Pink Floyd. They, they broadcast it live on Italian television. You can actually see it all on YouTube with all the Italian commentators at the start. And then it was yeah. broadcast live in England. I remember it at the time. So let's just um, have a quick look at this little promo for it. Yeah, just you can see a tiny little bit of the city there. So it was a floating barge in front of St. Martin's. Yeah, they, Mark's. they got wow. it was it was three actually three barges strapped mm. together, you know, wow. tied wow. together to build the stage. That stage that stage was five stories high, you know, ninety feet deep. And um, I can't remember how wide. And that's okay. just the, the proscenium itself without the wings. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you had to get all that gear out there and get it set up. Yeah. That, that was a three day dangerous. setup. <laughs> to me. Yeah, how, deep is that? how deep is the Grand Canal at that point? I mean, <laughs> I wonder how deep it is. Yeah. yeah how did it you was, get all that? It was crazy. Yeah. The, the, I don't know how the crew did it. I mean, they lived, you know, some of the production guys, I think they virtually lived on that barge for three days. Mm. They didn't get off. While I was staying at that lovely hotel at the back, you know, yeah. the Cipriani. <laughs> so Talk about guy, testing the limits. That yeah. looks like a logistical nightmare. My yes. God. Oh, absolute, yes. absolute nightmare. Absolute nightmare. But Dave wanted that to happen. It wasn't. It, it was all going to happen, and then it was not going to happen because of costs and stuff like that. And Dave said, make it happen. I'll pay. I'll foot the bill. Yeah. Wow. And, it, and it happened. Yeah. Yeah, if you watch the full coverage of it, it, it's a special, special evening. I know you had so much trouble running up to it, though, with, with the lo with like the gondoliers. Locals, yeah, the, the gondoliers, the guys down there. They were threatening to chop the cables that were running on that thing out to it. They were threatening to cut through those. And then Dave got the main gondolier guy on stage like he was his best buddy and uh, sweet introduced him to everybody. And then it was okay. We said, you can have the mosh pit for all your gondolas. Well, you know. that's them here, I think, isn't it? That must be there. That was a box seat, you know. Yeah. Look at this lot over here. This is all boats as well, isn't it? Over yeah. in the, the top. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. That is it crazy. Just, it's so and, crazy. And then uh, obviously obviously the square down here that we were playing to, St. Mark's Square, was just solid, solid people. Yeah. All along there is all plush hotels as well. You know, five star hotels all yeah. along that front. Wow. Did you guys spend time in Venice too? Or no, is it just yeah. all the production? I heard that Venice. Had no, well, I was I was there, I was there for weeks, you know, checking out, booking hotel rooms, checking out hotel rooms because we had so many VIPs turning mm. up. I had to make sure that you know Simon Le Bon and his family had the nice suite <laughs> facing the stage, you know, and people like that. Everybody yeah. wanted the best suite, of course. Everybody. Uh, uh, yeah, they wanted to be able to see the stage, you know. So I had to go into all these hotel rooms and 
and stand there and look. Oh, yeah, you can see the stage from here. We'll book that room. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Wow. Yeah. How, how much? How many weeks of prep were you there doing? I was there for about three weeks doing wow. that. But wow. The, 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 the setup only lasted three days. Only three days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, uh, it's just amazing that, that you guys could pull off something like that. That's, and that was yeah, all for one yeah, night of a show? If you, if you think that was lasers, you know, a, it, a five-story building with electricity and running water. Because the the lasers were water cooled. Oh Jesus! You know. Never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you you got to remember the laser tech back then. These things were huge, yeah. and they had to be water cooled. Yeah, they weren't pen yeah. lasers like we know now. Yeah. John, did you one? Yeah, you had a question, John. Well, no, I was going to point. I was going to say uh, the Grand Canal in Venice is an average of sixteen feet deep. All right, so that's not actually that deep. So you must have been a bit no. worried about draft. Like you, the stage. No, no, the barges don't drop. You know, they're, uh, they're okay. very shallow. Yeah. And yeah. this was one night. This was a one-off gig, just one night. One-off gig. Yeah, I think the mayor, he tried to give us a, a bill for a million dollars for the cleanup afterwards. Oh, I've yeah. seen the garbage and stuff that was left. Yeah, it was yeah. bad. But, but, but the, yeah. the, that was down to the town. That was down to the city, you know. Yeah, just got a little bit more um, footage. Which, uh, really... Did you have to look after the backing singers, Mel? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll give a shout out here because Berger McBroom, she's the middle one. Yeah. Uh, she's still touring with a Pink Floyd tribute band. All oh, right, okay. And she, really? She does wow. a lot, a lot of shows in Italy and South America. Oh, a wow. lot. She they love stop working. They love Pink she Floyd and working. prog rock in Italy. They love it. Oh that well, the first, the first, my first professional, you know, where I got paid for more than one gig. Uh, I done a tour of of Italy with a band called Van de Graaff Generator. Ooh. Yeah, and who were very prog rock, and you know they were massive in Italy. But, and we had riots there, you know, <coughs> fights, riots. riots. We, had to drive, wow. we had to drive out of the, put the band in the back of a, a transit van and drive it through some doors to get mm. away, to get them out of the building. The wow. famous Prague riots of 1973. <laughs> 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 we had riot mind. police really coming really in the parks, riot police with... Water cannons clear in the park. <laughs> the the graph generator. Yeah. That's the funny thing, though. Like the metalheads get the gigs, get the rap for I being think... rowdy at shows. It's all the prog nerds that are fucking It's prog, not up. metal. The metal fans <laughs> are was, great prog fans. It was very uh, political back then. You know, in oh, Italy, right. if you if you got more than two dozen people together, they'd turn it into a political rally. You know, the, the opposition mm. would turn wow. up and turn it into a political rally. So yeah. then the riot police would turn up. Yeah. They just like to fight. I've just been tear gassed. The only country I've been tear gassed in more than once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the prog riots. Never mind the Vietnam War protests. Never mind the civil rights protests. <laughs> the prog riots. Never mind. Prog prog riots. Riots. Uh, tell you, Eric Clapton's been tear gassed there. I went to a gig there. See Eric. We were there with Genesis. Sorry. We got tear gassed. Oh, we got tear gas with Van der Graaff generator. You know, actually, just do you about think, all do the you shows. Want, don't you think, Mal? It's part of the show in Italy. I mean, you expect it. The fans <laughs> tear gas. <laughs> <laughs> they do. 
a lot of people, are, and you'll get a lot of people turning up there trying to crash the gig. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah I they guess come so. for the tear gas. Stay for the gig. Yeah, yeah, they want. They just love that. Yeah, there you go. All right. So we're we're, we're probably uh, we've got a few couple more things I wanted to talk about before we wind up for the day. Um, you, towards the end of your time, before I guess you retired, and I'm assuming you are retired. I did I retired. Uh, you know, I all night nice Madison Square Garden with the Who. I've well not been to a concert yeah. since. So that was your last gigs, the Madison Square Garden 2000 tour gigs, yeah? With the yeah, I think we've done four nights at the gardens and I have not been to a concert since. Yeah, so did you get involved with The Who? I mean, how did that happen? Because you'd been working with Genesis, Page and Plant. Did you get so, a call? Yeah, from? well, same, same management as Page and Plant. Uh, so right, they okay. were going on tour and I got a call, you know, I wanted to come along and help out, you know. Yeah, and this was a great tour. This was, I think, what they called the Greatest Hits Tour. And I, I, I have to share with you this ticket, which uh, was one of the... I've seen The Who many, many... With yeah. Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros? Yes, that was I the support them. act. Yeah, that's that was the support act. This was... I've seen The Who many, many times, as you can that see from looks. my back wall. I'm a huge Who fan. But anyway, uh, this is possibly the finest gig I've ever seen them at. It, they were on fire, and Pete was on fire. It was a brilliant night. The crowd wouldn't leave at the end of the night. They had to get security to get us to leave. We wouldn't leave. Roger came mm -hmm. back out like three times at the end. It was just such a great gig. I don't know why, but Pete was on fire. Um, great, absolutely brilliant uh, tour and, and show. And, um, and the opener. Come on, Joe Stummer from the class. So I'm going to play a little clip of this uh, from, I think it was a gig in Detroit on the same tour. So if, if indulge me for a second. Yeah, with Zach in the background, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's like starting. It's on fire in this tour, really well. Right? Magnificent stuff. I, I do have warm, warm memories of that gig. Uh, you only did the one, there's just that one tour with them though, yeah, Mal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The only time I'd ever seen them before was at Charlton Athletic oh. Football Ground in the mid 70s. And yeah, that I've was got... just, and I only yeah. went along to that to see Little Feet. Oh, yeah, Little Feet, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I've... they were the opening act. I think I've got um, a Blu-ray of or a DVD of that Charlton gig because it's quite a famous one. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's they were fantastic of... though. I mean, Townsend just came on stage and just done that knee slide across the stage. You know, fantastic, fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. I mean, uh, it was Zach is Zach was perfect for them. Zach Starkey. I mean, he just yeah. absolutely. Oh, was, yeah. He had the 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 flamboyance of a Keith Moon, but with the precision of a real drummer, if I could put it that way. <laughs> a, a drummer, yeah. He was a proper drummer. He could hit them as well. He could that hit was, those yeah. drums. Yeah, Zach's lovely. Great drummer. I've seen him. I actually saw him with Oasis as well, playing drums with Oasis once. Yeah, that's right. You've done yeah. Oasis after that. Yeah, he's... Uh, but he, yeah, that was a, a, a brilliant tour. So thank you for tour managing that one. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah so uh quite a, i mean pete we know pete struggles with his hearing because of decades of abuse <laughs> like hey, i've got i've got you're saying that i've got a confession to make hmm. i'm i'm wearing 
hearing aids. I just had them fitted this week. Oh, yeah, all right, because you didn't have them last time we spoke. No. Yeah. How's that working? No, out? I didn't have them, and and that's because you know I, I suffered with tinnitus for I don't know how long. You know, for 20, 30 years. You know. Uh, are they are they and, like really tiny, like they say now? Do they fit well? Because I'm on my yeah, way. To yeah, have yeah. Them. People just don't know I'm wearing them. You know. Good. Good, because I don't want people to know I'm wearing them. I'm fine with I'm quite comfortable with it because now I can hear people, you know. Nice. So it's a, it's a boost, you know, for me. For it's you. a plus. That's, that's <laughs> great, man. It's great. I've got an aunt that is, I mean, the poor girl, she's got to be looking straight at you to understand what you're saying. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that's got to be awesome to be able to hear better now. Yep, I'm in a similar boat, and I'm only in oh. my mid-30s. The difference is, the Pope, is that we, we had to pay to yeah, get well, our hearing aids. Yeah, well, it's probably when mine went, you know, working yeah, with yeah, all those in the 70s. My, my, my hearing damage was uh, paid for by the U.S. government. Yeah. Yeah, we I paid. My hearing is because I paid to go to gigs. Malcolm got paid to have also his hearing true. ruined. That's <laughs> the difference. Uh, I wanted to thank our great friend, I can't throw it all up on the screen completely, WG, who's a great supporter of the channel, also of our my bourbon and boarding show on Saturday nights. Lovely chap, former hockey pro, WG. He says, tipped $50 and says, thank you, Malcolm, for the great history and behind the scenes stories. And thanks, Seventies, for another great episode. All the best. Well, thank you, WG. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, mate. And thank you, everyone, for being here today in, in the chat and, and uh, over on Rumble for watching. It's great to see you all. You've all been on fire. I know that like FKHC's been making a ton of great comments and, and, and <laughs> oh, various yeah. others. Tree Goblin's here too, Courtney. I know. I just said hi to Tree Goblin. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, thanks, everybody. I hope you've all, you're all you all enjoying it. Now, um. Courtney, you mentioned Slade. Yes, and my phone's about to die, and I'm going to just like poof out of existence. So let's get to like, Slade. <laughs> so Slade are one again, one of those bands that should have been huge in America, but never were. Certainly beloved in the UK. I mean, I grew up just one of my first favorite bands ever. Well, their one um, song became huge because of uh, what was it, Quiet Riot? Quiet Twisted Riot, Sister, yeah. Quiet Riot, yeah. Twisted, so whatever, yeah, they ruined it. One of the two. Come on, oh, feel I, the noise. I, yeah, come on, feel I yeah. just missed them. They were playing in Winchester, in, or the city near me. I mm -hmm. completely forgot to get tickets to it, but uh, they were just playing here. I would say they didn't become popular in the U.S. because of that haircut. Oh. <laughs> well, poor Dave. I mean, so, so, so Mal, tell, us, tell us about Slade, Mal. How did you get uh, that was pure bad luck. <laughs> Were they bad boys? <laughs> I was, I was, I was in LA and in in the studios with I can't remember who with, and somebody said, "Oh, we need, you know." This was in the 70s, so I was still working on the on the equipment. And they said, oh, can you come in? I said, yeah, I'm up for that, you know, as you do. Uh, it nearly killed me. It okay. nearly killed me. Oh, they man. were, you know, I think they were just trying to squeeze 10 pounds of shit into a five-pound bag. You know, <laughs> at the time. Clip that, Dustin. <laughs> so yeah. in, in what way i mean there's just too many gigs trying to do too many gigs or too many gigs too far apart you know mm. there was no sleep at all for anybody you know yeah as just, it's we were just big it gigs. was literally pack do a gig pack the truck drive get there unload set up do the gig pack the truck drive you know we were doing the driving as well. Hmm. Yeah. And is this, was this a, no. a support? Were they supporting someone or was this a headlining? No, they were, well, it was a mix. We were doing a mix of their own headline shows and uh, supports, you know. And what yeah. year was this was a, lot of, a lot of that in the 70s, you know, where you would turn up. Was this 75? And you'd be opening for Aerosmith one night and hmm. then they would be opening for you the next, you know. 
Mm, depending on the area you were in. Yeah. So it's 75, 1975-ish? Around about, then? Around about that time, yeah. Yeah, because I came back to England at the end of 76 or mid-76. Yeah. So well, that was the... Yeah, because, uh, honestly, and then we were in Keele Auditorium in St. Louis, Kansas City. I've forgotten which one it's in. I always forget that. We were in Keele yeah. Auditorium and we were set up and the manager, who was Chaz Chandler at the time, Jimmy Hendrix's manager, yeah, uh, yeah. came in and he said, why are you guys sitting around? He said, take the equipment down and put it back in the truck and get it out again. We said, what well, for? He said, well, for the practice. We said, he thought he was joking, but he was deadly serious. He was deadly serious. Jesus. And and I got sick on that tour, and they left me. They they literally dumped me, and I didn't even know where I was. I was somewhere in mm, mid America. Geez. So not and a great experience with, with the guys. Okay. No, I didn't have a great experience with them. But I did. You know, it's funny because Don, the drummer, mm -hmm. he uh, he had a, a terrible accident. He did in England, a motor accident, uh, and he damaged had brain damage at time. He had no sense of smell or taste, mm -hmm. but he liked to drink. He always wanted to drink vodka and Coke or something. So we used to just give him Coke. We were told, don't give him the drink. Don't. And he no, never knew the, the difference. <laughs> he used to get drunk. That was the thing. It's still because he'd be just... Psychosomatic. Another one. Yeah. Another, while he was playing, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If you ever watched the Slade... Do the Slade documentary, his accident was horrendous. And it was at the yeah, peak of the wars as a band. And he, he yeah. was out for like 18 months. And the first time back when he rehearsed with them, they said, well, let's play Come On, Feel the Noise or something. He said, yeah. how does it go? He couldn't remember yeah. a single song. Oh, song. exactly. He, he, yeah, he, <laughs> could, he couldn't remember. The, yeah, from night to night, that happened every night. Sure, he couldn't, you know, and yet he's still playing story. with them today. He's still playing with yeah, them Yeah, still there. Yeah. So Joe, Joe mentioned Big Jim Slade, and of course he mentioned Kentucky Fried Movie. I forgot <laughs> to play this video for WG to thank him for his tip. You have our gratitude. Fistful of yen. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> One of the greatest movies ever. Yeah, and then... Take him to Detroit. No! No, not Detroit! No! No, please! Anything with that! No! I'll never get tired of that clip. Never, <laughs> never. It's awesome. It's so the only just, appropriate response to being sent to Detroit. Exactly. Um, uh, I wanted to show a quick <laughs> clip of Slade, uh, Winterland in San Francisco in 1975. I don't know if you were with them then or not, Mal. Yeah, yeah. But, I well, was. Like, yeah, so this is Winterland in 1975, Slade. It is. Yeah. This one's called Goodbye to Jane. Freaking awesome band live! I've seen them. I was lucky enough to see them in their hometown. They sound America. great. I've never heard of this band. Oh, they so, rock! Yeah. And you can tell how loud they are too because you it, hear them. Is it the yeah, yeah. The bass is is overdriving the the mics that are being used. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Jim Lee, the bass player, is cool as hell. One of the coolest guys yeah. around. Dave yeah. Hill had the stupid hair. Robert. Dick Jim Lee, the bass player, cool as cool as. And he played a great fiddle. 
electric fiddle. Yeah, he did. Yeah. You really? Did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Slate, check that Winterland gig out from '75. It just it rocks hard, and they were they actually there's a song in it that sounds like they almost sound like Iggy and the Stooges at one point. That's absolutely so so rock, you know, punky. But um, so yeah, it's a shame you had a bad experience with them, though. Yeah, well, can't all be good. <laughs> mm. So, uh, unfortunately, we're probably going to have to to draw to a close soon. Um, I would like to thank everybody in the chat everyone that's watched the show on youtube and is watching on the replay please leave a, a thumbs up and a like and subscribe and all that good stuff we're 980 subs i think so we're looking to try and hit that magical mystical 1k where more people can see your stuff then apparently yeah. <laughs> it's been a yeah. struggle to get to the top right. of the mountain um but thanks everybody and uh, you've all been fantastic in the chat uh, before we say our goodbyes to, to Jane, or goodbye, that was the name of that song, goodbye to Jane, goodbyes to everybody, uh, I'd like to go around my esteemed panellists uh, and ask them all, uh, what are they up to soon? So, John, we'll start with you, buddy. Well, uh, besides me being here every Monday, uh, you can see me on Pop Culture Minefield at 10 a.m. Central, uh, Monday through Friday, and 1 to 3 uh, in the uh, afternoon. On, that's 1 to 3 p.m. Central, uh, also on Pop Culture Minefield. And that's uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you can see me on uh, Joe's Atmosphere show, usually on Wednesday nights. All right. Cool, mate. Thanks for being here. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Imp, you've been very quiet because we haven't covered uh, Mal's favorite. No, uh, I just like listening to these stories, actually. Yeah. Mal you know, hasn't worked with I any death great. metal bands, I don't think, have you? Ah, well. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so, so Imp, what are you up to these days, buddy? Uh, having a few minor tech issues that I have to contend with before I really do too much, but I should have those sorted out the next couple days. All right, I hope so, mate. Yeah, but... yeah, it's just some minor stuff. I know how to deal with it. It's just all hitting at once. Yeah, well, thanks, buddy, for being here. Oh, always, man, appreciate always. It. Do appreciate it very much. No, I appreciate hearing these stories. To me, this is great, both from Mal and Granny, and I unfortunately forgot the other guy's name. Wilco. Wilco. Yeah. Wilco. I am not Wilco. always good with names, but hearing these the stories from these three guys, and I've subscribed to their channel. I tend to listen to it at work. It makes my shifts go to that much faster. So I appreciate you know what you guys have done and willing to tell it, talk about it. Hey, that's what yeah. I I trend I I quit the business and. Music business, and that trend and became a chef. Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah. So let's you know, see. It's funny because Wilco's in, into photography. Yeah. Uh, Granny's into train spotting, and you're into the cooking. So you could do a real <laughs> YouTube show on that on your own, the three of you. Uh, yeah. We were trying, uh, th this company I work for, they were trying to get me and Gordon Ramsay, you know, to do. Mm -hmm. I was known as the rock and roll chef. Oh, and wow. I had to do this thing, you know, about food and rock and roll bands. You know, the riders that we had. You know, what bands like to eat, what. You know, hold that thought for the next show, and we'll <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Pope, my friend, what's happening with you, buddy? Again, always glad to be here. Like in Paris, said, really cool to hear these stories, especially because I was, you know, not around for a lot of it or was certainly too young to have seen these shows. So it's really cool to hear about them from a guy who was there. And then, uh, well, uh, yesterday we just uh, did uh, Exodus for Rock and Roll Religion. So next Sunday, uh, I think we're going to be covering Testament with, uh, again, Imperatus, mm. if he's around, uh, will be joining me for that one. Or if not, maybe we'll get some other people on. Uh, or maybe we will anyway. And uh, other than that, I believe next Thursday you can catch me for part three of our history of rock and roll from 1955 to 1970. We're going to be going into the end of it, uh, going over like the late 60s stuff like the Vietnam era and then uh, the runner up to heavy metal. And then uh, other than that, you can catch me every Monday on here and uh, occasionally on Friday on the MF or cocktail lounge. So uh, cool. hopefully see you there. Thanks, buddy. And no, in no way is tackling the entire history of rock and roll ambitious. That's totally no, not. not that's what I was say, man. I've got it. No problem. I was on his first show, and they barely got out of the fifties. I think. I think we made it to 1960. That was about. I think it. Mal was there for most of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dustin, my my good friend, how are you, sir? And thank you for being here. 
What's oh no, man, no, my pleasure being here. I mean, this is amazing to me just being able to listen and interact. And uh, so, as far as my channel, Keto Simple, uh, we've got product reviews coming up. As always, we usually drop two of those a week, and then I uh, make shorts and stuff. So if that interests you, then come on out and check that out. And um, here with Brian on uh, this on this channel, and then I've been helping him out on uh, Pop Culture Minefield as well. Uh, so yeah, just thanks again so much for having me. It's just it's an honor to me. Uh, our pleasure, mate. Thanks for being here and and helping out with everything you do. Appreciate it, uh, Joe, my good friend and wizard wizard artist, great artist as well. Let's talk yeah. about that. Well, man, you know, uh, you guys can check out the lineup by going to the channel, you know, uh, but what's behind me is the comic book I'm working on there. Uh, I do that every Saturday live, so you can check that out. Uh, I got a show with my brother doing the headlines on Thursdays. Uh, John already mentioned the one I do with my friends, the ones that uh, show up uh, on Wednesdays uh, called State of the Atmosphere. And uh, I do a wrestling show on Pop Culture Minefield on Sundays uh at one nice. o'clock that john runs for us uh so I, i'm a big wrestling fan which uh everybody knows that but uh it's just great I, i'm the son of a dj uh, i've listened to a lot of this stuff not all of it of course there's no way you can hear every band there is but man it's fun to pick your brain mal and, and uh, about these these uh older bands and and what they did on tour and stuff like that is really cool i can't wait for my father to see this stuff and by the way brian i put a link to their facebook page if you want to pop it up and show everybody yeah. uh it's in the private chat if you want to show i it. will do that buddy thanks and yep. uh i did that earlier appreciate you up. you'll stay up appreciate you being here very much joe thanks, for sure buddy. man for sure uh let me just find that link you guys prevaricate for a few seconds and then i'll mm -hmm. do that prevaricate um, yeah, I make sure to check well, the share this word Facebook. of the day. That's got to be the <laughs> word of the day. Yes. If you want me to share it on my screen, I can, man. I've got it up. No, hang on. You could extemporize okay. as well if you want. But, okay, uh, no problem, man. <laughs> but yeah, Mal, uh, uh, my dad, uh, I, I'd love to get him on here, but he's he's 82. He doesn't do YouTube, so you know. <laughs> oh, but he would my... pick your brain for hours, man, just like Brian's. Oh doing, man, no there's not much left to pick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a right. DJ up in uh, the Virginia area. They call him the music man up there. He used to have a oh, show yeah. called Roots of Rock uh, that played from like, uh, what, nine in the morning till noon every Saturday. Wow. Yeah, had his own record store. That's what he did when he retired from the Air Force. He, he loves music, man. Yep. So apparently we lost Courtney, and I'm sorry, Courtney. I didn't really yeah. drop. Um, but, Courtney, thank you for being here. Much love to you. Um Great to see you, and uh, you guys have all been fantastic in helping build this channel to to what we are. We hope it's becoming, and you know, getting eyeballs on it. And we've had such fun. I do appreciate you all very much from the heart of my bottom. I hope you know that. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> or is it the other way around? Uh, just before we we have a final words with Mal, I'd just like to uh, show you what I'm up to soon. Shit, there's shit happening. There we go. Right, so um, <laughs> <laughs> shit is happening. Okay, so on Tuesday, Where's Darius, when you need him. For, well, okay. exactly. I, 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 just, I, can't, I can't manage this ship on my own. It's 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 like a gondolier in Venice when Pink Floyd appear. More fucking gondoliers. That's what they say. <laughs> that's a Monty Python joke. Um, but anyway, um. Tomorrow night, first of all, tonight is the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs, so go Stars. Go Bruins. So get, Bruins, who are they? Um, hey, watch it now. So, Tuesday night on my good friend Nick Visor's channel, 32 Flavors of Nick Visor, it's Toxic Tuesdays, and tomorrow night is Reservoir Dogs. So, check, in, check that out, please. Um, the next... Rowdy show coming up is back on Pop Culture Minefield on Thursday morning. Morning coffee with Brian and Wilco will be back on. Wilco, the quiet one. Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> Most vocal one out of all of them. Yeah. Uh, we're actually going to talk a lot, I think, about... We haven't really talked with him about the film festival stuff he did, so we're probably going to get into that quite a bit. But uh, that's Thursday morning. Um... Then next Monday 
on this channel at this time we're going to take a break from the rock and roll we're going back to the canon film club and we're going to cover the missing in action movies this is going how to many be of those did they awesome. make three oh these wow. this is going to be awesome hopefully we'll have all the guests that we normally have yeah for it this will be a lot of fun so get that in your diaries everybody next monday canon film club missing in action and then i can't forget though before then saturday night 10 p.m mountain time brahma bull and i do our hockey and drinking show bourbon and boarding hope was on last uh week and may well be on again this week uh what, where you actually be... let bruins fans on that show we do Amazing. as long as they're sober that was really nice this time. So, so we're um we'll so we'll be diving into the first week of playoff action uh, on this Saturday's show. It should be an awful lot of fun. We had a great show last Saturday on my YouTube and Brahma's Rumble channel. So we we multi multi broad stream whatever you call it. So that's uh, some of the things coming up. As I say, a lot of exciting stuff, and and there is more planned with various other people artists and um, technical people in the rock world and working on some very exciting guests stay tuned so mal mm. thank you sir for being you're here. welcome it's always a pleasure it's yeah. a pleasure talking to you guys you know find somebody that's interested you know people that uh, appreciate you know no, and we, understand we, we are so yeah. honoured uh, to have you on, mate. You and, and, no, it's, it's, uh, the pleasure is all mine, guys. Anytime, you know, yeah, yeah. I enjoy it. You know, I run away, talk. You know, just tell me to shut up. You know, <laughs> no, yeah, the point me. is to, to dig into that knowledge you got about these bands and stuff, man. It's great. Thank you yeah, for being with us. As I say, we're very honoured. It's been an absolute blast tonight. I don't know if you've got any final words about the rowdies. I know those. I know Granny's in the UK now, and yeah, just, yeah. You know, well, next week we're all heading down to Devon, a place called Painton in Devon. Um, we're going to record a whole bunch of rock and roll rowdy stuff that will be putting out on YouTube. So it's it, it the, the the thing works better when we're all together. You know, it's like a group. You know, you can't do this, a group performing, you know, and when we're together, we perform. <laughs> <laughs> You've learned mm -hmm. from the best, I guess, working yeah, for these bands. Just, the it bounces, it bounces. I'd be a flat really, wall for that. Yeah. Well, well, well. Maybe uh, you can join us, Brian. Brian, maybe you can join us when we're in Devon next week. Well, we have got a show lined up. It, we're going to yeah. do one with with you guys in the studio. It will be not next Thursday, uh, but the Thursday after. Thursday after. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So two yeah. weeks. That's it. Yeah. So I'll have I you guys Wilco, on. Wilco is arriving here. Yeah, I'm in Kent, and he's arriving here at the weekend. Did and, you call him a Kent? Yes. You said he was a Kent. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> um, that's cock that's Cockney rhyming slang. Yeah, yeah so I can <laughs> think wrong of vowel. Him. So just like Gary Glitter is Cockney rhyming slang too, but that's <laughs> um so the uh we're not gonna go into that, this is a family show. Uh the uh it's but yeah, it's been our honor and privilege, mate. As I say, we will be talking to you in two weeks' time and, and then definitely again in the in, in the future. Okay, yeah. It's been a yeah, blast. Like said, we're gonna we're gonna be recording a whole bunch of and stuff uh that we're gonna be putting out on uh, on YouTube. Yeah, and I know what you guys are doing to that and you're trying to get a speaking tour going in the fall and the Yeah, audience. yeah, we've uh, we we're getting offers in for, you know, uh, cause Mark uh who He's one of our, the guys. The fourth one that we've he's, he's still yet. gigging. He's still gigging with Wishbone Ash around the country mm -hmm. and around Europe, and the promoters are very interested in getting us guys. Wow. I don't know why, you know, they, but so, they're yeah. very keen on getting us guys to turn up there. I don't know. Oh, that would be awesome, and I, and I'm, if if that's happening, I'm I'm coming over to to as long as they got, them. you know, on the rider we've got D fibs, you know. D -fibs. <laughs> Metamucil, defibs, yeah, back braces. <laughs> we need them, you know. Yeah. Right? We got oxygen and defibs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, just to answer, a quick, I've got to answer FKHC two thousand five, and good to see you in the joining the show, uh, the chat. Um, FKCHC. 
when do you think are doing Delta Force? Well, we could do Delta Force at the next Canon Film Club, although that would be too many Chuck Norris's in a row. So I think we might want to break it up. <laughs> Got to bust it up occasionally. We may have to. We can only do so much Chuck Norris. I mean, are um, you crazy? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, you could survive it. So there's potentially speaking to it. I know Wilco's trying to get you guys some kind of television gig too. Let's hope. Oh, it's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. All right. Anyway. They keep talk. They keep talking about it, and the television people keep saying, "Yeah, we really want to do this," but it's just time and time. Is, yeah. You know. So, but, but anyway, thanks, mate. I know it's late there for you at night, so I do appreciate. Yeah, it's just a late night for me. It's you know, it's twelve thirty at night. You can sleep in in the morning, so you'll be fine. No, I can't. I have dogs that need walking <laughs> first thing well, in the morning. We better let you go. Fighting under the panel. I see Thanks. this. I see that sun come up every yeah. morning. You don't have to, to drop off straight away. We'll play the outro, but uh, and we'll see our <laughs> goodbyes backstage. But thank you again, Mal. Thanks, everyone. Okay, guys. Panel. Thanks to the chat. See you all soon.